All right, well, let's get into it. Today's guest is Doug Cook, owner, founder of Motion Raceworks, uh, outspoken member of the car community, anti-electric vehicle advocate, um, massive asset to the car community in so many ways. And I'm um, going to kind of get with him, do some pushback because me and Doug disagree on a couple things. <laughs> but Naturally. Uh, is the car community the best group of people in the world that also gets the most amount of hate? Is yeah, it? I, I mean, I think I've, well, thanks for having me, first of all. But yeah, I think like if you really dig into it, especially me from the business side, people are, you know, there's a lot of hate going back and forth. That's because people are passionate about like mm -hmm. whatever they believe in. They're also passionate about their car. I mean, that's why when something goes wrong in their car, whether it's our part or somebody's, you see them so mad. Well, because they spent all their money and free time doing this. So it's yeah. like, it's just the reason why it's great is a passion. The reason why it's sometimes a little bit hard to bear, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons is also the passion. But it's such like a American hobby. Not It's a worldwide hobby, but it's such like a, like a pretty harmless hobby that we all do. But I feel like we get so much outside pushback. Yeah. And it's so insane that yeah. we get this because like, you know, oh, your car's so bad for the environment. How, how many hours of idle time even do you have on your race car a year <laughs> like uh, yeah i mean <laughs> that's hours. what i think if you put the math behind it it's kind of absurd that it's even a focal point because whether you're talking about boating or people with private aircraft or you know a whole slew of things i mean it's because it's loud it's in your face it's flashy mm -hmm. and you know, there's a lot of passionate people who are outspoken. So I've heard some people in the car community even make the argument like we're we're putting it in people's face more with the drag and drive stuff. Yeah. Even though it's the best thing to do with a car. Yeah. And then it's kind of like the double edged sword. You're like, oh, this is the fun thing to do. But it's also not. Yeah. Under the radar at all. Yeah. Without a doubt, it's it's uh, definitely the most edgy thing and the most like in your face thing right now. But if you think about hot rodding, it's kind of like the essence of hot rodding. That's mm -hmm. why it's attractive. I mean, most people just don't want to have a semi rig with all the stuff. And this is, it's appealing to, yeah. I mean, you can put chip together and. Yeah, go I mean, out that's there a great car for it. El Toro or whatever. It's like, it's a, it's an, it, the reason why I like it, it's an entry point, whether you're just cruising along as like the, the cruise long portion or you're actually racing, you can race at whatever level. Yeah, I had Tom Bailey on, and he's just very energized about drag and drive, and he's not super energized about a lot of things. No, he's with. actually the least energetic person. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of my best friends, but like he's awesome. You don't get him super fired up calm. That much. You don't yeah. really get much emotion no. from him, and then you talk about drag and drive stuff, and he kind of lights up a little bit. Yep, <laughs> so it's pretty funny. But then um, I also don't think we should hide. You know? No. So it's kind of like... No, there's got to like, be a certain amount of pushback. And, like, I think people are willing to give concessions one way or another. And, you know, one of the things I thought about recently that is kind of really interesting is, like, the... You remember the cash for clunkers deal? Yeah. So, like, I think before... That really drove a lot of innovation in the, the car world. Mm -hmm. So I find myself in this, like, predicament, like, oh, yeah, you know, I like the old days. But then you think about that and, like... I mean, even the new hot rods that are coming out, like the C8 Corvette, like they get incredible gas mileage. That, I mean, it was a thing back then, but your normal car is getting incredible gas mileage while yeah. being a performance-oriented thing. So, my know. LS, my 5.3 and my Mustang, probably cruising at like 30 gets as good of gas mileage as the V6 that came in it. Yeah. No, I mean, I think a lot of the drag and drive vehicles get incredible fuel mileage. So, like. I wouldn't say all, but like yeah, a lot of them get better than what most people would expect. They're well, we're just... trying to get good gas mileage. We don't <laughs> want to stop at the gas station yeah. constantly. We want to run those cars as good as possible. Yeah, and I think honestly that whole craze is driving innovation because you want to put less stress on your car. You want to get better mm -hmm. fuel mileage. You want to work on it less. I mean, let's be honest. Most people don't want to actually get greasy and oily and stuff like that like yeah i'm not huge on it because it's hot in the sun already so as a part salesman i guess you would love a drag and drive because the consumables yeah become everything yeah everything on a drag and drive is a consumable at that point on yeah. a car yeah i mean to a certain degree you're right and then also like what's cool about the drag and drive is it makes you have a, a like a tight setup all the way across the board you can't just mm. come out with some thing that's barely holding on it drives you to build a better car and it allows like 
some of our innovative products to be utilized, you know? Yeah. The clash, cash for clunkers thing is really funny to, to look back on because yep. it was just one of those classic failed government programs. Yes. But I think in a sense, like, that was the first, like, crackdown for EPA stuff. And mm -hmm. at the time, I was like, this is crazy, you know. But, but then when you're selling think, cars that weren't even running and stuff, like, they were oh, just yeah, completely they, scamming the system. Yeah, you talk about something that was not well executed, that was <laughs> it. But, uh, you know, you, they did get, like, a bunch of seven-mile-per-gallon Dodge Durangos off mm -hmm. of the, you know, off the streets. And probably in turn, the new Dodge Durango is better. I don't know if they even still make that. But. Yeah, they were probably not going to last very long to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> they were probably going to break. But I, I heard, like, some of the cars that were getting destroyed were, like, Novas and stuff like that. Because, yeah. you know, I think it was, it like, 08, it came out right when the market was crashing to, yep. get, yeah. to get people money in people's hands and stuff like that. But then people were pulling, like, a barn find. To go get 500 bucks. Yeah, that was an atrocity. I mean, I'm like all for getting rid of the, you know. How many Fox bodies, 240s, oh. and like F bodies uh, got yeah. destroyed that didn't have to? Yeah. That's where it gets that, sad. That part stinks. I didn't really, I remember, because I was pretty young back then, like in the beginning of Hot Rod stuff. It was like 08, wasn't it? I think it was about 08, that, 09, yeah. maybe? Like 06 to 09 ish. Uh, yeah, I remember like, because I would still like do junkyarding stuff back then, and I was just like, I don't remember seeing anything cool, but uh, yeah. I'm sure it did happen. Yeah, kind of like sure. a gun buyback, right? Like they, you know. Yeah, and then people were probably putting four wheels on like a a wooden cart and yeah, saying it's a car and getting. There's people bucks. like whittling a piece of wood out and trading it as a gun. There's mm -hmm. people like turning Tommy guns in. You know, I've seen that. You go set up like a little booth, and you're like, I'll pay uh, fifty dollars more than they will. <laughs> That's what we should have done. If I would have had money back then, I would have just. Done I was that. in sixth grade, so <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't buying anything. <laughs> Fair enough. But they didn't really do that on Long Island because yeah, everything was rusty. Mm. So like, even the cars that were getting turned in were just like rust buckets and mm -hmm. ruined, anyways. Yeah. But the EPA is known for doing things that don't work. I think they're doing things right now that don't. I mean, work. they're a three-letter agency, so. That's true. Yeah, we can start this off with attacks on the EPA instantly because I haven't had anybody on here that really can help me attack the EPA a little bit here. Yeah. <laughs> I explain it to people that aren't in the car world and they just don't they just don't understand anything that's going on with the EPA. It's crazy the uneducation. Yeah, I remember you you were telling me that uh you went to see the senator, local senator yep. here in Manatee County, and mm -hmm. they really had no idea of like any of the stuff going on, which is kind of startling. It kind of just shows you the runaway nature of what all that is. And I think there's a balance, but yeah, it's I, I think the car community is passionate about it and like upset, but we have to learn to, you know, have effective ways to, you know, get our actual governing body to yeah. rally back against, you know, for at least meaningful things. Do you feel like being f in Florida helps a lot of your companies? Because you have a few. Obviously, you have more than one LLC. Yeah. It's no, not. I mean, I was very pro-business as well. So uh, that's where Motion, Motion Raceworks is out of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think uh, that's a good place for that. So uh, TBM is obviously down here in Florida. Yeah, you guys butt up to like a cornfield up there, which is yeah. farmers are the other ones fighting yeah. the EPA. Yeah. So you kind of have like... The whole centralized yep. group. Yeah, I've never been up to motion up there. Yeah, you should uh, definitely come up sometime. It's uh, well, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. If you're, if you're around that way, you should stop in. I know. There's I not was, a lot of excitement outside of what we do. I saw you guys are having an open house for six summer, and I was like, dang, I wish I was up there for that one. Yeah, that'll be pretty cool. Uh, you know, like honestly, the first thing we ever kind of got known for is Drag Week came through in 2016. Uh, our Iowa location, we had a party, and like we still have customers from that today. So now that six summers coming through, we figure we just have a big blowout party. Yeah, you've had some crazy drag and drive experiences. Yeah, your hurricane one is wild. Yeah, I, I think I've done thirteen now. Thirteen? Yeah. Shoot, I was like, oh, he's probably done like seven or eight. Yeah, I started adding it up on the last drag and drive. Like I, I've lost that like that fear, or that like weird feeling in your gut. Like now when I just yeah, I feel like I could pull out of the car we just built yesterday and not feel bad about it. But Yeah, when you're like 200 miles from your trailer and you still are like <laughs> fearlessly turning up the car. Yeah, exactly. Like at this point, me and Red are just like, whatever, we'll figure it out. But Yeah, well, Red yeah. is a awesome freaking co-pilot. I mean, yeah. He was helping me on 
sick week because I had all lights failure. <laughs> yeah, we pretty much rewired your car at what, like midnight? Yep, we hot wired it to like just make it, but I still had no headlights on the darkest road in all of Florida, I it think. It was one of the sketchiest things I've ever seen on a drag and drive. Uh, no, I was by myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I think there was like wiring running out and around the car through the door. Yeah, yep. that, was, uh, that was not a fun experience. I think we got home at like 3 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, as a result of that. But yeah, like 2018, we did a drag and drive in a hurricane. Uh, I actually bailed out because I was afraid of hurricane being a Iowa guy. I mean, it's fair to not drive your race car into a hurricane. That's we, a, that's a reasonable decision to make. We left, uh, Atlanta and like prior to that, I think we'd done like three, maybe dragon drives and they're all in the Midwest. And I was like, you know what? I'm tired of carrying these like road tires. So I'm just going to use my 275 radials <laughs> And promptly, like, poured to the point where I was driving, like, 11 miles an hour down the highway and still about to go off the road. Yeah. And uh, it was a wild experience. Like, I remember stopping on a bridge and watching Tom Bailey come by with his, like, super swamper mud tires at, like, 70 miles an hour. Like, nothing was wrong. And I'm like, I got to step my game up. Yeah, you started running those, like, Mickey Thompson off-road tires yeah. on there. Those are wild. That guy's fearless. And that was when your car... Was that the one where you were having issues and Kyle Loftus had the famous, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> should have LS swapped it on? Oh, you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, like, at my darkest moment, I'm laying in the rain, like, trying to figure out an ignition issue, and he's like making fun of me. Kyle Loftus comes up giggling. You can always count on that with him. Oh, yeah, which is perfectly fine. I mean, that's kind of his job to just yeah. like exploit you, harass, yeah, harass the people that are yeah. willingly laying into pain because mm -hmm. that's kind of what you do is like. The pain is is that way on a dragon drive, and we always kind of follow it. If you can't laugh about it, like, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Sometimes when you're a little far away from your trailer, it's like the stress does start to kick in. Mm hmm Like, um, we're up in Gainesville, or, yeah, Gainesville, and I hear, like, a knocking on my engine. Mm. And I was just like, oh. This is going to be a long day. Yeah. You I, know your day just got extra long. You're like, I just need to make it now. Mm -hmm. I think like a lot of the stress for people on drag and drives come from, comes from a lack of preparation. You're probably guilty of that too, but like, yeah, I like to be like, I'm so crazy that I like to have like a fresh ring and pinion in the car. I rebuild mm -hmm. the transmission. A lot of times if the motor has any, even a questionable amount of wear on it, like, all new fluids and some people just show up and they're like whatever and i'm like oof that's gonna not be good for you in a couple days i've seen james do that a few times oh, yeah he is the king of that james is my boy but he yeah. has no like fear going into nope. completely going out. into the abyss oh yeah like changing the oil not even worried about it you know <laughs> i like we the first dragon drive that we took ruby on i don't think like james even thought like anything about it you just like loaded the car up and it was just like like we showed up and he goes to me he's like you got a tire pressure gauge i was like what <laughs> you didn't bring a tire pressure gauge and i had to give it to him that day and i had to go get one because red and i actually opted out of like traveling with you guys after the first one because we realized how unprepared uh the overall cletus crew was back then that's fair I don't it was like you. cars overheating on the first day i'm like we could have avoided this type of deal, but I think the first thought was like, "All right, what are we doing for video?" Yep. Second thought was like hotel rooms, and then like fifth thought was like, "Okay, there's cars." Oh yeah, involved you, could, in this. you guys were like super understaffed at that point. You had nobody to work on your stuff. Plus, you're doing like everything. Yeah, we didn't really know how to work on stuff either. Well, that, still, arguably, don't know how to work on stuff. <laughs> I don't. The evolution has definitely improved the quality of that type of stuff for you. It's your, went up a whole, little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's I still don't know how to work on stuff. Well, we're all learning. <laughs> nice yeah. shirt, by the way. Yeah, thank you. I told That's my wife. I was like, man, I hope Doug doesn't think I'm trying to butter him up here wearing one of his shirts, even though I put this on before <laughs> yeah. we even texted this morning. It's all good. It's Completely all good. unplanned, this whole podcast Yeah, it works deal. out that we're literally almost neighbors, and uh, but it's also kind of crazy it's taken this long for us to get together. I know it's it's all honestly good though because now you get to experience the good podcast studio. Yeah, this new setup's awesome, man. The other ones are a little little rougher. Yeah, I was waiting for you to kind of tighten things up a little. Bit. Yeah, we we started to figure it out now. <laughs> so you moved TBM to Bradenton yep. instead of Iowa because yep. you were like, might as well move it to where I want to be. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a subcomponent of like, you know, it's nice down here in Florida, but mm-hmm. it came from Camarillo, California. The weather there was beautiful. There's no way I was getting those guys to move to I- DeWitt, Iowa, That's where it's true. negative 40. Think about that. But then, like, in my head, I'm like, Bradenton's like the racing capital of the world. Florida is definitely, you mm-hmm. know, especially as far as drag racing goes. So I wanted to be accessible to people. I don't want to have to overnight every single part everywhere. Yeah. Um, it was That's... kind of a no-brainer. And you said you moved every employee? Yeah, it was actually a relatively small company. Mm-hmm. Uh they were only four people, one, one including the owner. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we moved them across the country. Uh, Tim, the, the you know the guy with the trucking channel, Tim Gentry. Yeah, he actually just packed everything up in a semi and moved it across <laughs> the country. And they got here a day early, and I, they like called me. I was in my pajamas, and I went and unloaded the semi by myself. Uh, so it was kind of a scary endeavor. Yeah, that's pretty cool though that you're able to retain the entire company because like some people would assume oh he moved you know he bought the company and then like you know now it's motion employees building the stuff but then all the same guys yeah well natural progression like the one guy got a little homesick so he he left and but uh jason was kind of the guy everybody knew the main yeah. guy and yeah it I was think it's tanner that i always see racing too yeah our whole tanner actually moved from california but afterwards so, oh. Yeah, strangely enough. Uh, honestly, our whole goal was just they they needed a company. They needed the ability to manufacture, and that's what we had to offer TBM. It wasn't like we wanted to gut it or change it significantly yeah. in any fashion. You already um, wanted those parts and those those manufacturing. You just wanted to make more of it. Yeah, the product was, was good. I think we've made some improvements, but, yeah, it was uh, – I find myself as we grow, I'm like, I can see where like private equity and all that stuff goes with when they buy these companies. But like, I have also watched them make a lot of the wrong moves and it's like short term gains. So I'm like learning from it. You know, as we get bigger, I want to keep getting more companies and we have another couple that that we're going to acquire in the next year. But like, it's, uh, it's definitely like you have to be careful not to lose the soul of whatever Mm -hmm. you're doing. Do you feel that there are some other big companies already kind of breathing down the neck of some companies you're looking at maybe? Because, like, there's some, there's a couple big car brands right now that are yeah, Pac-Man style scooping up everything they can. Oh, I don't definitely. know what the concept behind it is. I think there's some. They're essentially just, like, putting a, you know, they're trying to bolt on good companies to a bad company to make the whole company worth more is mm. essentially how a private equity works. Like, if you got kind of a a loser and a good one they're like well we need to buy the good one and then the whole you know and then they resell it they're just they're literally trying to resell whatever they're buying Uh, and they're getting economies of scale out of like shipping departments and you know executive staff and all that but no i think i honestly i think uh you'll still see more of you know these I, i would call it like two or three big corporations buying up people but largely like a lot of the cool thing about motorsports is they're mom and pop shops and they're people who have a passion and even though they want to get out, they want it to go to the right hands. That's what happened with TBM. Um, and the one will probably be closing on probably by the time this video is out, like same thing. They've been approached by the big companies and they're mm-hmm. like, no, I don't want like what I worked my whole life on to be just gutted like that. So, yeah, I can see that, especially for drag racers that have all these like people that depend on their brand yeah and then all of a sudden you're gonna start giving them a subpar product to the same people that you yeah basically built a brand with i mean we i feel like we built a brand alongside motion raceworks because i mean shoot you were you came to help us on leroy when i hadn't even heard of motion raceworks at the time yeah it was kind of just like, oh, I think they like sell fuel systems and turbos. Yeah, exactly. And you didn't really have like a catalog of yeah. parts. It was kind of just like a couple things. Yeah, we just kind of scraped by. Like we knew what we wanted to do, but we didn't have the capital to have machine like tons of machines and stuff. I think we had maybe one back then, but it's uh, pretty crazy that you're able to like bootstrap a business up like that. Cause not many people, when they start a business that size, don't end up like owning twenty percent of it. Yeah. And everybody else owns, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, obviously, you know, you have partners, but yep. like, it's not. No, definitely. Like, it's the hard way. Like, a lot, like, oh, there's companies that started at the same time as Motion. I watch, like, their owners, like, ball out and stuff. I'm like, man, what am I doing wrong? Mm-hmm. But when you, I mean, we started Motion with literally $3,000. 
and I think it was like four years before we even borrowed money. I think we borrowed money for a machine and then paid it off. Like we've always been like, buy, pay it off, buy, pay yeah. it off. That's a hard way. And that's like not the fun way. You know, you don't get to have pro mods and crazy stuff, but like, yeah. Well, you kind of are building a pro mod. You're close now. It's a no mod, yeah. At this point, I mean, yeah. it's a small block pro mod. Yeah. What were you thinking building a small block? <laughs> are you crazy? <sighs> Big blocks are all the rage, dude. Yeah, I just have always done my own thing. <laughs> kind of like you, you know what I mean? Bad choices. and I really believe in that Gen 5 LT platform. Like, I think uh, when it comes down to, like, there's, if you want to break it down, there's two types of Dragon Drives. There's, like, Sick Week, which is the only one like it, where they have good prep and you can really lay it out. Yep. And the rest of them just don't have prep, like, for the most part. And in that case, there's no there's no downfall to having a small block. You're going to you're going to be able to manage power easier and I it, it'll be able to run up front just as well as anybody but when you look at sick week it's out of control already i mean you got tom with a <laughs> all the power he can ever all the power in a light yeah. chassis like i'm like well if i can't beat that then i'll just do my own thing so but the big tire cars seem to really struggle on sick week yeah they're because the prep is too good mm -hmm. that they get into that tire shake and just parts start to come apart yeah, no, I mean, you. That's it's like a catch-22, right? Like, Brett LaSalle is, like, right down Broadway every yeah. pass. Uh, Garrett, same deal. And the big tire cars, I mean, they can make it work, but it's definitely harder. It's, mm -hmm. I never understood that, like, in the beginning of my car venture. Like, slicks love terrible prep, you know, for the most yeah. part. So it's, uh, it's, like I said, I think the Nova will shine in most of the other Dragon Drives, and uh, we did we built it in a way that we could put a bigger tire on it if we wanted to. So I kind of get into the same, like, I'll be at the track and somebody's like, yeah, and then you start feeding the power and talking about my car. I'm like, the power is fed <laughs> in. Like, it's it's all in by the 60 foot. If it's not all in, like, yep. I'm not going very fast. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially like how most class cars in the world are. They're they're all power in it like a second, you mm -hmm. know, so. Well, the class racing is a completely crazy animal in itself. Yeah. I mean, those guys have to be on the ragged edge of their car coming apart. Oh, yeah. Every pass. And I think I think Dragon Drive's starting to get there. Like it's close. A lot of people tearing a lot of parts up. It's mm -hmm. uh Started out like I feel like it didn't get enough respect in the car world, but uh, there's starting to be some guys that have their stuff together. And well, it took like 15 years for it to really become like wildfire, like it is right now. I mean, there's yep. a dragon drive going on this weekend in Oklahoma, yep, and then next week in um, Michigan, right? Right, yep, yeah, in Michigan, Iowa. Uh, it starts in Iowa and then goes up to Wisconsin and then back down to okay. Iowa, yeah, yeah, so that area, yeah, but then yeah, you're talking about like almost one a month I feel like anymore mm -hmm. and there used to be literally just one drag week yeah and, and then there's people doing the stats on it which is really cool yeah the dragon drive.com yep those guys are doing like all kinds of stats I was number 100 for a while there top 100 <laughs> <laughs> you get a sticker I should I should get like a custom sticker like yeah. after the first dragon drive of the year I was top 100 dragon drive participation trophy yes I was <laughs> I was number 100 I mean I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that says but out of 100 something. <laughs> yeah, exactly but then quickly off that list yeah but I was already petitioning I was like all right so the eighth mile ones don't count the short ones don't count because if you only do two events or three drag like yeah three drag strips hard to compare to the guys that did a thousand miles yeah and i think they have a long ways to go too with like creating parity and rules like what good does any of that do if like the rules are all over the place and like yeah you know it i don't know i i think the promoters of that all need to get together and be like we're gonna have one subset of rules that way everything's comparable yeah and john why sears not? you busy <laughs> yeah i'll get my boy john on the line yeah what's really interesting guy. about drag and drive is drag week back in like 2000 early like 2012 maybe dude it was on fire you had like doug klein and larry larson and tom and uh the amx and all that stuff like those guys were fast back then a lot of them just kind of got into family life and had to stop doing it but if those guys were around now it'd be even more exciting yeah but I mean, the larger larson, base wasn't there back then yeah now the fan base is huge mm -hmm. sick sick the mag has done such an awesome job with branding he is yes. in, he is a level 10 branding expert yep. on all of that and i always tell people that i'm like just look at it everything's covered in stickers decals the whole nine they just came out with their movie yep like it's plus most people don't have the balls that tom has to like 
He just went all in. 100%. He could have lost like hundreds of thousands of dollars with Sick Week and all the different yep. stuff he's done, but like he just believed in what he was doing. Are so. you going to go out to uh, Death Week? Heck no, dude. <laughs> Uh, you will well first of all it's in California second of all it's gonna be hotter than Hades Mm -hmm. and you're not gonna run fast or have fun anyways so it definitely doesn't seem like my definition of fun no because I feel like in California like the Nazi you know like emissions police are gonna just be breathing down your neck I mean those guys get in trouble for like changing their tires and in California so Isn't that crazy? You can't even have, like, small generators there. Yeah. You're not allowed to have, like, small gas engines, like dirt bikes. Yeah, how do you charge your Tesla? Yeah, what the heck? When the the lights go out, you know? The grid goes down on us here. Find out the hard way, I suppose. Your wind wind turbines aren't going to do it. (laughs) Hopes and dreams, man. Hopes and dreams. That's a whole different conversation in itself. (laughs) That might be episode two podcast. I can get going on that. So the car industry can be very toxic. We all know that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure you've uh, you've gotten into your fair share of fights with or debates online with people. Yeah, talking about freaking parts and stuff. I've I've been there. I've yeah. I've defended it personally. Yep. And then making parts, you kind of like put yourself completely out there. Mm-hmm. Coming out with an original part, like when you guys did the throttle bodies and yep. like shifters and stuff, like you're. You're kind of diving into like a big market. Yeah. Does it, that worry you, like knowing that you're going to get the pushback, or you just know your engineering's? No, I think, I mean, you have to be okay with failing to a certain degree because, like, there's no perfect product. Like, we have six engineers that work full time. Like, that's a lot of overhead, and they're smart dudes, and they're really, mm-hmm. you know, into what. But when you, when you have something that's used across so many spectrums and so many, some people don't feel, follow instructions, some people do, you know, you have, manufacturing tolerances like you just have to work through it like if you don't have a stomach for it which i think is why a lot of people don't manufacture parts because uh i heard a really good saying the other day of if it's man-made it can be man broke Mm. and the kind of the crossover is like whose fault is it when it breaks you know you have to be able to like accept when it's a manufacturing thing and you have to like how do you tell somebody you broke it like the classic you know pointing at everybody else thing like a bit, pretty much what we like. It used to really keep me up at night, but now it's just like we have six engineers. So when we find a problem, we just shoot it to them and we put mm-hmm. a team on it and try and fix it the best we can. Like if it's in fact our fault, but yeah, it definitely about, takes a stomach to to do it. Like what about that? Like so you come out with like a new part <clears throat> and then in like six months you're like oh we should change it in this way and then you're like oh all those ones that we sold now there's this updated one yeah how do you like go about that or is it just like like, playstation one two three four and five whatever you know it's you'd be a company would be foolish not to improve their own product yeah you know what i mean and i think to if it's if it's like truly something that's wrong we try to make it right with people um but if it's just an improvement it's like well do you want us to like stop and go fishing yeah that's you know? where it's tough it's like i'm sure some companies are struggling with that they're like oh we can improve it this much but then we make our own product yeah that everybody already has look so bad yeah that you're kind of like in this limbo of like like without a doubt behind the scenes like almost every product we have whether it's like m- finish of the product or function or something that broke we we improve stuff all the time Mm -hmm. we might not always push it out and what was wrong might not actually be like a huge problem or a problem at all but like sometimes we'll just catch things like ah it would be better if it was like this and we just make subtle changes we don't make press releases about it just yeah you you have to keep getting better you know what i mean and that's how you can feel good about what you're doing, I think. You know, if if you put it out and then you just tell everybody they're wrong and it's their own fault when stuff breaks, it's like, well. Especially coming out with parts that have, like, a lot of moving parts, like the throttle bodies and shifters. Like, mm-hmm. those are not just, like, a turbo flange. No. That just is a stationary piece that you put it in and never have to look at it again. Yeah, it's complicated because there's, like, 20 places that can go wrong, like, We've learned some valuable lessons when you send something to anodize. Sometimes it, the part might stay exactly the same, or the next time it actually loses a thousandth of clearance, mm-hmm. and maybe press fit and a pin will fall out as a result of that. And like, it's it's crazy. Like manufacturing will definitely keep you on your toes. But I mean, going back to a partnership, like there's four of us now, and it's like we have a good team that can. If it was just me, I'd be, 
I'd probably be out by now. <laughs> Seems like three of the partners are manufacturing guys. I don't know if that fourth one is really... Fourth uh, one just tries to break everything. <laughs> He's uh, just the guy that breaks stuff. But that's valuable, too. Yeah, you kind of need that. You need that. Especially because you guys, I mean, you have a lot of project cars, I feel like, between the three of you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Garrett's yeah. separate than that, yeah. but like the three of you. But I don't see you having enough time to even work on your project cars and then go out and test all the parts. Yeah, I mean, having, having Garrett around has been pretty valuable from that aspect. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> at the end of the day trying to work on your car. We actually um, made a big push to, like, just have, like, a department of just people working on cars, but mm -hmm. then they got pulled into, like, manufacturing when we got busy and stuff and never went back. So it's Before long, you're welding um, steering racks and columns. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a crazy animal. So, but, uh, yeah, well, I think... We like right now we're building a OBS with like a ZZ six thirty two motor. It's, I saw that. That looks awesome. It's gonna be the coolest car in the fleet, I think, because like it's like looks like a farm truck on the outside. Mm -hmm. I even though that moniker is like played out, but then it's gonna be pretty sweet. Those motors are so cool when GM launched that because it's like plug and play, ready to go. Yeah. GM bolt pattern makes your life simple. I thought it was like. I kind of overlooked it at first. I was like, eh, it's just like a 572. Like, they had that ZZ 572 back in the day, like in mm -hmm. the 90s and 2000s. I'm like, oh, whatever. But then when you look at it, you're like, you put power and ground to it, and it makes a 1,004 horsepower on pump gas. Yeah, that's really cool. I would love to do you one know. of those. And, like, even, like, you know, my LSA Mustang, mm -hmm. it would be much cooler and simpler yep. with a big block that makes 300 more horsepower. Yeah. And, and runs on 93. And you probably never have to mess with the thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm hoping that's the case. <laughs> yeah, well, if you don't put boost to it, yeah. and it's just out of the box, like, making them power, like, I doubt you'll have to do anything to it. Yeah, the technology on that engine is pretty sweet, and it took me a minute to realize it, but... What does it have for, like, EFI, or is it just... It runs on a Terminator X. Okay. Yeah. That's but cool. what's cool is they integrated, like, a... LS style cam and crank sensor into it. Mm -hmm. That's like behind the covers. It's not like some external crank trigger. Oh. Uh, it's it. They're like creeping up on an LS package as a big block or vice versa. I don't know how you'd sell that. Yeah, they used to have those E rod deals that a lot of people were. I mean, they still do, but like, yep. I don't think people are putting E rods in a lot of things yeah. now because they're kind of pricey. Yeah, but the the crate motors and then they do the LT crate motors and mm -hmm. you're pretty big on the uh, LT platform. I think it's a better engine and cylinder head than an LS from what I've seen. Yeah, if you can get rid of the direct injection, which is absolutely terrible, uh, it, it's a great motor. And now it's easy to get rid of. Yeah. Yep. And then you just run it like an LS. I think, what was that your main woes of growing pains on that motor? Yeah, the first three years of the Nova, I, I was trying to run direct injection. Of course, I'm not an EFI guy, I'm not a tuner. There's probably somebody more qualified than I was. but You were I, on HP tuners at the time, right? It was like HP tuners, and then I think it had MS3 Pro on the port injection side, and it was just like every change you made here, you'd have to adjust. It was, it was a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, a direct injection makes power, but it's not worth the, the, the effort. So, And those heads flow so much better than LSs. Yeah, they're incredible. I like, And the, bo the motor is stronger. Of course, if you run out of fuel, it'll split in half like what I did. But uh, like the, the motor, the block stronger, less head gasket issues, better heads. It's it's a pretty awesome engine. And Pete's putting it together for you right now, right? Yeah, he actually already finished the new engine. So the pretty badass. You know? Did he find out anything cool about him when he was like, because I'm sure that was probably one of his early explorations into an LT deal. Well, the, the motor that was in the Nova was originally built by AES. And they did a pretty darn good job. And then Pete did some improvements, but he doesn't really say much. I don't know if you've been around Pete no. a lot. He is a silent killer. Like <laughs> the stuff when you actually break down, like how in depth he gets into engine and design and stuff, and like the things he does, the subtle things. He uh, he doesn't talk about them, so he's just kind of like yeah. He I lays he low, secrets. but has some pretty incredible stuff that they do. I've never really talked to him much, but tuners in general aren't exactly the most talkative people yeah if, if your tuner's really good and really smart he's probably more keeps to himself and just it's a personality a thing right like yeah it's, it's a personality type you're not like usually outgoing if you're that type of person yeah so. if you're a computer guy and you yeah. kind of just tune the car i mean alpha my tuner he's a close friend of mine but after my pass he he turns i'm run i run quarter mile he turns and walks away 
after the eighth mile because he's done watching. Yeah, he's, he's like, like I saw not enough. Do that second eighth mile. <laughs> he yeah. saw enough. He's like, I, yeah. I got my data. It's I, I film and then walk away. That's it. I mean, that's true. The cars rarely improve in the eighth quarter. No, it's, that's where things are bad. Power upgrades. Yeah. I don't enjoy that second yeah. eighth mile. Like I like eighth mile racing. It, I know quarter mile is more fun from the outside, but eighth mile is definitely where it's at from a driver's standpoint. Visually more fun for sure. As the brakes guy, I can imagine you prefer eighth mile too. Selling people brakes, <sighs> dude. We did a uh, we did a calculation on mullet, and that thing is. I know people do not appreciate how like heavy and fast that thing is. Going like two twenty. And weighing 3,500 pounds was like the equivalent of like a 2,800 pound car going like 278 miles an hour. I'm like, he's arguably, no matter what brand brakes you're running, he's that is the hardest car on brakes ever, mm -hmm. basically ever. I mean, you just don't see that weight and that speed. So, we, no. I mean, we've learned a lot off of it. And I mean, it's been pretty successful. It but doesn't even terrifying. Make, even for like a safety aspect in general, like yeah. that weight and that speed is like. That is like a scary combination because like Fox body going that speed. Okay. You know, it's yeah. light. It's not like it's not an army tank yeah. going that fast, but that car is heavy. That's a lot of mass and momentum. Uh, it, it's really pretty amazing. It's like defied all odds, really. I got to watch TBMs. I, I saw a parachute failure in the lane next to me mm -hmm. when I was in um, Darlington. I was racing Devin Vanderhoof's uh, white Fox body and I watched him go I think like 206 next to me and no shoots out and I just see the brakes just redder and redder and redder as I'm coming up to him yeah and I pull up next to him and I get out and I'm like man are you okay and he's like oh yeah brakes were good <laughs> I was like yeah. you're not like like your parachute's all like hung up like you could tell the parachute was like attempted to deploy yeah and we're running quarter mile on thankfully a pretty Pretty good track, and this track was weird. It had like a roundabout at the end. Oh yeah, so you that car's not like, light either. No, no. So it's I, like the the funny thing about our brakes, like the orangeness, like people almost like I feel like they almost put that with failure. Like, mm -hmm. they're like guys, brakes were orange. I'm like, yeah, it's because they were working. You know, yeah. they're either working or they're not. And obviously, they were working if they stopped them. The hard part about drag racing brakes, and that's something that will keep you up at night, is like everybody wants the lightest weight front brake with a two-piston caliper, but they also want it to stop when the parachutes <laughs> fail. And it's like, okay, how do we, like, find that balance? And we've made some really awesome improvements, but it's like, well, yeah, we could put a heavy, a big four-piston brake in a heavy rotor, but that's not, like, what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop technology that finds that balance, you yeah. know, so. Especially the heavier cars, that gets really weird, like, even not gear, but, like, you know, Dodges, like, big full-size vehicles that people are drag racing now late yep. model stuff basically anything late model well the cool heavy. thing about those cars is like their stuff is so heavy that you can put a big half inch thick rotor and a huge four piston caliper and you still drop 40 pounds off what they currently have yeah and you're like a hero and it stops better than it did with the what was on it from the factory and you're like oh that was easy that it's makes these, sense it's yeah. these fast like medium weight cars that really push the limits and then weight distribution is probably a big part of that, I would imagine, too, because, like, yeah. Devin's car is big block, big turbo all the way in the front. The other thing that we're up against, too, uh, from a braking standpoint, is, like, everybody monitors oil pressure, right, like, on their engine. Everybody monitors transmission pressure. Now they have dumps and everything. But people will literally just bolt brakes on, not know what master cylinder they have, pedal mm -hmm. ratio. They have no idea, like, how much active pressure is at the caliper when they hit the brakes. And then... It's like you're trying to build a brake that suffices all that. Like our calipers work at 700 psi, and like a lot of times people will call and be like, "Yeah, I got my car out for track for the first time, and it, you know, it's how it was having a hard time stopping." They go through it. I'm like, "You had 100 psi of brake pressure. <laughs> like it's not gonna stop. Like it's not yeah. gonna stop with anything like that." Oh, okay. And they'll call me and they'll fix it, and I'm like, "Oh, these are great now." Like the brakes are the, always the last thought for anybody. Yeah. Like naturally as racers. For sure. It's definitely like a minor thing. You're thinking about going fast. Not yeah. What happens after you do that. Exactly. You're like, oh, now I have to stop. Yeah. Like, same reason people don't put parachutes on cars usually like right away. I mean, some <sighs> people do, but others people don't, don't put cages in cars or anything. Yeah. It's always uh, so that's kind of our struggle with the brake stuff. But I think we're educating people and making things better as a whole. It's a it's Not an interesting box. It's an interesting thing because, you know, 10 years ago. 
to build a car that was like max effort was like 950. Yeah. Like, like you could build that in your garage relatively easily. Now it's like people building 650 cars in their garage is like yeah. quarter mile 650. You have to be an expert on all of it at that point. Yeah. My, my uh, orange Mustang, when I built it in like 2010, people would like fly up to watch it run and it went like, 880s you know and they're like that is crazy and they people like back in our hometown they still talk about it to this day and like you said now it's you yeah. see mullet go like 680 you're like well it could have gone 50s you yeah. know you're like oh darn he must have lifted or something yeah or you're like hey your your small block slow like hypothetically it goes 680 it technically is slow compared to those guys you know <sighs> fast it's crazy is, i tell people that all the time fast is so relative because mm-hmm. I think there's a time when everybody just ends up with a Hemi and a screwblower, and and it's less, you know, that's how pro mod is. Does sound like a fun future, though. Yeah, I don't mind. Are I wouldn't fun. mind it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm convinced they're pretty awesome. Yeah, I just had Justin Swanstrom on the other day, and he yeah. was talking about his four thousand horsepower screw blown Noonan block. Yeah, Lyle was like car. Lyle Barnett was like turbo, whatever guy. He was a turbo guy. Period. And uh, he drove a screw blower. I remember, like, because he was staying at my house for snowbirds. And he's like, this is the best thing ever. I'm never driving anything else. Like, of course he will. But yeah. I was like, wow, I think I need to drive one of these. There's something also so great about not bumping a car in when you're used to, like, like when you get on the trans brake, you always have that split second, like, is it going to get up? Yep. You always think that because anything could is cause it CO2 not to. Is my CO2 on? Is Yeah, yeah. whatever. A screw blown car or like my supercharged Mustang, like you grab the trans brake, you floor it, that's it. Mm-hmm. It works. It does it or something's blown up. But like yep. a turbo car could do weird things. Yeah, I'm like, I'm pretty excited about blower stuff. We just bought that Copo car to start racing stock yep. eliminator and NHRA. And it's like, this thing's cool. Like, sounds cool. Mm-hmm. They just work. There's a lot less components. I mean, I'm still a turbo guy, but it's pretty cool. Copos have always been pretty cool cars to me. Like they're, like the thought of them and like a factory race car with solid rear axle, basically, you know, everything that you dream was on like a out of the box. Yeah, it's like you guys gen. knew what we wanted, clearly. Yeah. And then they're like, but it doesn't have a VIN. And you're exactly. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. You're so close. Like, I mean, essentially, it doesn't have that far of a deviation from like a ZL1 motor in it. It's just a little bit more, you know more powerful but it's like Mm -hmm. like you said the whole car is something cool yeah and then like the they have like holly from factory and they when you really look around those cars like the first time i was looking around i was like wow there's a lot of like holly stuff but like also copo specific stuff Mm -hmm. that are really cool parts that Mm -hmm. you're like where do you buy that like i want one of those exactly there's a lot of weird stuff like that i'm sure you noticed when you were oh yeah no they're their own animal but they're uh they're, they're cool car even like the intake ducts that they always like yeah the carbon, those carbon deals yeah super cool setup they yeah. had like cool throttle cables and stuff too yep. though they had like yeah they trick things yeah I think uh, I think they did a good job with them overall I mean obviously they're built to please the masses mm-hmm. for the most part but they're a neat car yeah they, it's a tough one because I've never like had the desire to race a copo because the copo racing is seems so at least like. Five years ago when I was at LS Fest the first time, I looked down at the sheet and I was like, do they only list reaction time? <laughs> That's all they had listed for the car. Really? It was just like the Copa class. And then there was like 0.08, 0.0. Like I was like, what? So that's what you're racing? <laughs> well, they not, like if you go at the World Series of Pro Mod this year out at Bradenton, they had the factory showdown cars. Mm-hmm. Those things are wild. They spin like 95 or 10,000 RPM and are blo- supercharged and everything. Yeah. Like, that class is highly relatable. I think they're missing the boat, not exposing it. I think a factory-sealed motor class would be really fun, but a little more all-out. Yeah. Like, because I think drifting kind of gets into the same world where it's like you run away with the budget. Yeah. But then when you put something like, you can't open your engine. Yeah. I know they do some factory-sealed, but it's more just like bracket stuff and like yeah. index. Like NMRA has like the Coyote stock and all that. Yeah. Uh, but those cars know. get expensive. You end up with titanium and ceramic everything. And I think that's why drag and drive. Well, I know that's why drag and drive is so appealing because literally I can go out there and race Garrett. And if he doesn't make it to the next 
track i like there's two components to it like yeah you, you know you actually finish it's not just the fastest car you have to like make a ton like if you abort a pass and you don't get another mm -hmm. there's so many variables and it's kind of like a card game at that point and there's even like the i've seen people put pressure on other competitors a little bit too mm -hmm. like when you load up and you're out before like 10 a.m. Oh, and no. other people are just like unloading you start to get like the pressure on you like oh, your yeah. competitors there makes you break stuff <laughs> yeah it makes you yeah. think like oh man like he's really confident in himself like like Devin at sick week he, he made one that, yep. the guy was eating like lunch you know at a nice restaurant because he was done so early I know I was really um really disappointed a few times but granted they run it in an order where yep the fast guys get to go first thing yep and then I was watching Jim and Brett do the same thing where they were kind of packing up and heading out early. Thankfully, they would kind of hang out with me a little bit, but then they'd be yeah. like, see ya. See ya, dude. <laughs> yeah, and then we pick you up at the gas station. Yeah, on the and then side you come the and rescue me. They had their own problems that night, though, too. Yeah. That, no, I think, I think there's a place for both types of racing. Like, I don't want to do 10 Dragon Drives a year because you can't get enough time off work, even if yeah. you're the owner of the company. But, like... I've seen a lot of people from like Comp Eliminator and stuff from NHRA. They built drag and drive cars, and they're like, "This is the most fun I've ever had." You know, so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's definitely it'll recharge your batteries on vehicles. The community behind it is definitely yeah. top tier. You can't be a jerk in that racing because <laughs> karma will hit you quickly, yep. expeditiously. It'll get you really quickly. I love Rocky Mountain Race Week. People ask me all the time. They're like, "Oh, are you doing Rocky Mountain Race Week?" I just like I can't justify the eighteen hour drive. To get there. Yeah, from Florida, it's like almost a different country. Yeah. I'm Actually, like, there's different countries that are way closer. Yeah, you could drive to Mexico before you could drive <laughs> yeah. to Rocky yeah. Mountain Race Week, I think, or but Canada. If you, but if you get the chance, that just the scenery is... When you take a picture of your race car at the top of like a mountain, it's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Well, my last one I did in that GT500, and it's just... I don't think I can compare to that. No. It you were out for so a Sunday good. drive. You were just having fun. I it remember that. It was so good in that thing, because like, I would like rip up the highway and then I would loop back, get behind everybody, do the same thing again. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I've already seen this twice. So yeah, go up and down the mountains. I already had lunch there. We should go back there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good spot. We were there earlier. Yeah. And then you guys, I think, I don't know if that was the same time you guys did it in the Crown Vic. Yeah, that Where was you... the same year. That was the most fun I ever had. And like, we basically took a Crown Vic and because my Nova had questionable breakage but it was i don't mm -hmm. know we, we didn't want to chance it because we just got an engine back and uh yeah we bought a crown vic for 1500 bucks and went the beginning of the week i think it ran 1890 and the end of the week it went 1389 so yeah, that's a pretty healthy gain yeah i think i think at some point i'm going to do a competition where like everybody buys a 1500 dollars car and do that throughout the week that would be fun and there's also With a budget there's a lot of shake up in that whole area of tracks right now like they're in a very volatile yeah. state where like Pueblo is the worst place to stay overnight in the country. I think. Proven fact: <laughs> I've every time I've been there, I've almost been robbed. Yeah, every well, single time. Pueblo, like worst. I stayed place at to like stay. three different areas of town too, and like I walk out, I'm like, okay, today's the day I get mugged. Yep. Bandemir's closing. Kearney, I think, has their own stuff going on, right? Yeah, they got. They're like in a legal disagreement, uh, or not disagreement. They're in a legal battle over. Somebody paved the track and did it incorrectly, and it was like millions of dollars. So. And then uh, I think even the other track is having something weird going on. But uh, it's owned by the city, right? That one? Or oh, that no. One? I was thinking of Great Bend. Kearney's good to go. Yeah, Kearney's yeah. good. Great Bend is the Great one. Great Bend is the one, that the, the one with the resurfacing. I issues. don't envy Matt Frost right now. No, it's tough for him. Uh, you know, like the track thing, I'm like really passionate about keeping tracks open. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, we were all at the the conference or the thing at the, the courthouse here in yep. Bradenton, but like. It's definitely makes these towns are built around having tracks there, you know, yeah. and it's like when that happens, it really does put an impact on it. But in the same breath, if you look at how many tracks exist, drag, drag strips, I guess, there's actually a net positive right now over the last like five years, uh, five years ago. There's a bunch of little tracks popping up, but it definitely puts a dagger in a situation like Rocky Mountain Race Week yeah. where... Well, where else are you going to drive through the mountains to go from? You'd have to purposely go out for no reason up there. You're going to have to start running eighth mile more because yes. there's like I can list a few eighth mile tracks in Florida, but then there's much less quarter miles. Yep. So you're going to have to start doing that. Well, in just the same way, no prep 
uh, makes things more affordable. Eighth Mile makes the track more profitable. They don't have to prep the whole thing. Yeah. They don't have to pave the whole thing. Like it's, I yeah. If you like Eighth Mile, I think there's a lot more racing out there in the world for you. So. There's some good Eighth Mile tracks. I think like Galat is a recently built one, like fairly. And didn't yeah, I don't they know. Heat, is that Eighth Mile? Didn't they heat the Eighth Mile? I think. Yeah, I think that one is that. I've heard that track <laughs> is phenomenal, and I think the guy who owns it is like a hobby thing for him, which. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That's you not know, a bad way to do it. Takes the pressure off of events, mm-hmm. you know, but it's it's tough because everybody wants to go to the event and not pay a huge entry fee, and you want to get, like, families in there inexpensive, mm-hmm. but at the same point, tracks have to make money. I've been up to, uh, or I've been looking at that one. I think Ozark just opened up. or is Yeah, it, I think Blake from one? 417 somehow involved in that, and that track's always, from what I understand, has been a good track, but they seem to really have things going on. Yeah, there, like so. up on a mountain, too. Yeah, I, I think don't it's, know about that. I thought, or maybe it's one of those where they were showing it like on a mountain. That's in West Virginia. It's that called one. like Heaven Hill or something like that. It's fairly fresh though, isn't it? Yeah, it's only like a couple of years old, and I think they're trying to find a new manager for the track. Uh, but it looks, it looks like maybe that's where rock. Maybe it's not rock. That'd be what mountains would that be? Um, yeah, it'd probably be the Rockies, right? No, it's on the, the Andes. East Coast. I don't know. I'm not yeah. good at geography. Yeah, I'm, I'm missing that. Would that would maybe be a race week, a mountain race week. I don't know. I think that's where the mountain people live. There's conspiracies about that. <laughs> There's mountain know. people up in the... <laughs> I mean, they're probably living right up there. I want to explore more drag strips because I get too, like stuck in my ways and then it's somebody's hard like, to oh, leave. there's a race here and you're like how's the prep and then you're like ah oh, it's bad thinking it's hard to leave bradenton like when you go anywhere else in the country just your bradenton tune needs to be put in a separate file yeah and you're starting over because you can go out here on a tuesday and just rip how you can, go anywhere else and it's like their good prep is rarely that good how come it's the nhra tracks that are closing <laughs> heck if i know i mean I it's, think that uh, NHRA is a corporation, and they're there to make money, and they're getting offers, and they're, uh, I don't know, I guess they're choosing their own fate. Maybe they don't need as many, you know, meets throughout the year. It's hard to say. Yeah, I know. I, I think Gainesville is safe, but Gainesville doesn't do enough for regular racers. I call myself a regular racer because I don't Seems have like they semi. want to, though. I would hope that they, they need, like, the right promoter. Every racetrack in the country is always looking for the right promoter. Yeah, it's like, and the manager of business. It could be the same components, but if they aren't pulling the right strings, you know. Mm-hmm. But from what I understand, Derek Putnam, who's the announcer at Sick Week, oh, yeah. uh, he's been putting on some events, and it sounds like the whole staff there is excited about bringing new events. So let's just hope that's uh, yeah. that continues on, and that would be we nice. can support them. And I would. I went up there for his last race, and it, unfortunately, it. It didn't rain out, but it got so foggy that it was like, you know, Florida fog sometimes. Yeah. You're like you're you're wet. And yeah, your windshield's raining. wet just from driving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they had to cut it out like before we even got into round one. I was just like, damn it. So yeah. close. And that unfortunately happens a lot to us. Especially yeah, Florida racing strange. Like you get to race when nobody else is racing, but even though the weather is good the rest of the year, for the most part, you just can't race. There's we, some weird conditions. We were out in 150 degree track temp the other day. Yeah, it's, that's a Nuts. tough one to go down. It was, it was gooey. It's when you bolt on the slicks and let her eat. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, uh. So um, merchandise seems to be kind of a weird one for you guys. Did you expect merchandise to be what it is? Because like no. you're a parts manufacturer, and now you're like um. A, a, yeah, I mean, I think, like, I'm my passion is marketing and sales, and, like, that's kind of my background. I like the innovation, and I, I'm usually, I try to be, like, the, or I'm, I'm trying to be the guy that comes up with the ideas, you know, because I build a lot of cars, but, like, I think having a good brand is, does a lot for a business. And yeah. Originally, I was just like, eh, I'm just honored if somebody wears my shirt, and now it's like, yeah, we do a lot of, there's a lot of merch that goes out the door. Yeah, I mean, you guys show up to Cletus and Cars, and it's like, the merch is, like, the important thing yeah. at that point. It's so kind of crazy because it seems like you accidentally built a merchandise company on the back of what you were building as a parts manufacturer. You're right. You're right. And yeah. it's like this big thing in itself. You guys did a motor giveaway and probably yeah. do more giveaways down the line. Yeah, it's fun. And I think, uh, you know, it just easier. helps put a personality behind the business, really. Like, I think it's, I think more businesses should focus on it, but. It's tough because in the beginning, nobody wants to buy your stuff. And then, yeah. Um, but, 
you know, at the end of the day, how many, like, if you're a, a car person, which you've seen the stands packed at all these different races, what else do you, other than Cletus merchandise or, you know, Finnegan, like what else do you buy? So yeah. I mean, it's pretty much just motion stuff has like the cult following of like, there are probably people out there that are wearing a motion race works hat or a shirt that don't even like have any thought about like, Oh, they, they got parts too. Yeah. Like, and I'm fine with that. I mean, Hey, it's, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to call you for tech support. So yeah. It's only a lot true. easier. Yeah. I mean, I, my hope is that, like, if they are that passionate about the brand that they're wearing that, like, when they finally get into, you know, the automotive space as far as building a car, that they that's, like, where they go. But, I honestly, that's one of my favorite things about Garrett is he's bringing so many new people. And YouTube yeah. in general, like, when you look at Vice Grip or you or Garrett or um, Brent from PFI, you talk to people at these races and they're like, yeah, I didn't even like cars. Mm-hmm. And then I bought a shirt and then now I'm building a car, you know, so... I mean, there is a funnel to it, like yep. an entry point. It was funny up in Indy because it was connected with Top Alcohol. Yep. And Top Alcohol probably hasn't seen stands filled for their racing. Yeah, it's pretty safe to say that, like, Top Alcohol, the only people in the stands are the crew members or their families, usually. And that's not a dig on them, but it's just no, it's widely just, not respected. It's like bracket racing. It just yeah. doesn't, like, it's for the racers more and, than it's for, like, a viewership. And, and they're then, badass cars. It doesn't make sense. Like, that's it blows my mind because I'm. I think I know where you're getting at. Like the second day, there was nobody in the stands because the Kalita stuff was at the circle mm-hmm. track. And I'm like, how, what can we do to make this like bigger? I mean, you have Tony Stewart driving a top alcohol car. He won. He won. Like, and you look over at the stands, and there's three people in the stands. Like, guys, it's crazy that the disparity and the viewership and the, the attendance and stuff. Even though like. I mean, let's face it. They were literally racing Crown Vicks. You guys are racing Crown Vicks. The least Clapped cool out. car ever in terms of like a racing yeah. oriented vehicle. And they're racing 3,000 horse, 4,000 horsepower top alcohol cars. And no, and people are watching the Crown Vicks. Yeah, they're like, going. What a time to be alive. Those were impressive cars to watch. I've never been around top alcohol really because yeah. I never really had the like push to go out there because... Yep. Not really that much for me as like somebody who wants to actually be in the seat of a car. Yeah, it's not really relatable for the most part. Yeah, it's even though it is cool. And I was watching them tear it down, and I'm like, man, that looks kind of (laughs) easy. They're tearing those things down because everything's right there. I think there's something to be said about a Hemi screw or roots blower. Like they're right there. It's simple. Yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways, like a Pro Mod's probably easier to. Well, it's definitely easier to work on than some of these like full bodied cars. So. Yeah, it definitely makes it a lot easier. And then, um, so on top of the merch, Motion also has the YouTube channel, which is kind of interesting in itself because yeah. around like a parts business has like these other, like your YouTube channel is probably the ultimate marketing tool ever. Yeah, I mean, I really just started it to put instructions out there and like tech tips um, and it kind of evolved and we're like, oh, let's try to build. Mm-hmm. I still rarely focus on YouTube, even though I should do more, but there's only so much you can do in a day. And Yeah. It's like this free marketing machine for you guys, though, yeah. because if you go out and just race a car, yep. it's like you get the views and you don't have to plug any brand besides what the channel is. So it's yep. kind of like a cool. Yeah, it definitely helps offset the cost of some of the racing we do. Uh, but. I mean, in the end of the day, it's just like our parts. We really developed it to, like, help improve people's experience. Because, I mean, anybody can build a car, but if they don't have fun doing it or if it's, like, they build it in a way that's really hard to work on or it's not successful, that you can almost guarantee they're going to leave. So, like, my YouTube channel, I'm like, if I teach people how to build things Mm -hmm. where they don't overheat and the transmission works and it goes down the track, like, maybe they'll enjoy racing more. Hopefully that's kind of what people get out of it. And build cars with the end goal in mind. Yes. So many people start building something and they're just like, now I can't race it anywhere. Or I can't, you know, I can't even drive it to the local cruise in because it's got a push bar and no radiator. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, But, I mean, everybody has a different goal in what they're building, you know? But that's what I mean. Like, so many people go into it. Like, I've had conversations with people that are like, I want to build this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay, why? Like, what are you, what are you going to do with it when it's done? Yeah. Because I can, can guarantee. Can afford to do that? Yeah. Because I can guarantee if you build a hot rod and you're like, I want to go drive it at Cars and Coffee, you're going to eventually be like, all right, I don't actually want to drive this thing 
yeah. to every cars and coffee because it's 90 degrees and it doesn't have AC. Yeah, exactly. And if you build it where it's hard to work on, you're going to hate it. Yeah, and if you, I, I did and, that. And if you build like, if you build a big block methanol turbocharged car that just eats up transmissions and converters and motors, like you're not going to be able to afford it. So you're going to hate it. So yeah, having a purpose and a realistic goal is important. Yeah. Have you had to get past a lot of like the misinformation of like, people will be like, oh, these don't work for this, that, and the other thing, and, like, trying to fight through some of that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, like, the brakes. Like, things have to be used properly, and it, we're guys, right? Like, I think our demographic's, like, 99.7 male. Yeah. No disrespect to the females. I love you guys out there, but, like... I think we're 97% on this the, channel, so... The first thing, you know, I do when I get instructions thrown to the side, and I get mad when I can't figure out why it works. Well, they do the same thing in cars, so... Um, that's why I'm like, if we proactively build cars on the channel and show how things are supposed to be used or do tech tips, hopefully that'll improve that. Whether it's our part or somebody else's. I mean, like you said in the beginning, we sold other people's parts. Yeah. We had a ton of like aeromotive tech tips and magna fuel and stuff like that. So how do you feel about the, um, the drop shippers? Cause that, um, sometimes it frustrates me. I mean, I think shipping. they're great. It's, it's a conundrum because they're oftentimes the best tech support and they're the most for you, like right there for mm -hmm. you. Um, I think drop shippers are fine. It's just, you know, you, hopefully they hold up like when people, when people, uh, are not doing it for a living, it frustrates a lot of the other companies. Um, I'm not really at that point at, anymore where it like bothers me that much, but like, if you're trying to make a living selling this and this guy's just trying to like go out to eat on what he makes off of this and you know, doesn't support it. That's where it's frustrating. Yeah. But like, there's a lot of great people who work in their garage or, you know, that's where motion started. So uh, sometimes the drop shipping stuff can get me a little frustrated because yeah. I know people don't have it in stock and some people have it in stock yep. and they spend a lot of money to have that in stock. But you can't find who has it in stock. Yeah. Realistically, like, that is the shadow games make the trust. Like, I think that's, it's it's their biggest holdup. You know, it was ours, too. Like, you have to have it in stock because today people want to overnight everything. Yeah. Like, because COVID drove us to think that nobody has anything in stock. So if you find it, it's like, I need it right now before something happens. So. And a lot of stuff isn't in stock. And, like, when I go to induction performance, they have shelves full of cams and stuff like that that are hard to get. Yep. And I'm like, man, like, so many people are probably selling these right now and don't even have them in mm -hmm. stock. And that's where it's, like, a tough, frustrating thing where I guess the brands would probably just have to crack down on what yeah. dealers do. And I know Holly kind of went the wrong way on that one a little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just like any other business. You have to be able to trust them. And uh, I don't know. I I have a lack of trust across the board. So I just like call the company. I'm like, can this ship today? And mm -hmm. can you overnight it? Yes. Okay, cool. I'll buy it. And if not, it's like, eh. You know, you start to get that feeling like, oh, well, it'll drop ship from the manufacturer. Like, no, it won't. Well, then it drives you to like Summit. Yeah. Which That's where they excel, yeah. Because they have it. Like yep. it shows in stock on their website. Yep. If you're really. transparent, it sells. And I mean... Our goal at Motion now, like our biggest thing is to have whatever we sell on a shelf. And it's not mm -hmm. always perfect, but it's like if you don't have it on a shelf, people aren't going to buy it. And you guys have and the benefit expensive. of having your own products, so you're not worried about like not yeah. like not having them on the shelves. Yeah, we can physically. Yeah, we're the ones them. making it. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, making our own products a lot of fun for that mm -hmm. reason. What is the hardest angle of that business then? Because you have to do. The engineering all the way to getting it in somebody's hand to helping them put it on their car. Yeah, I would say right now um, is just keeping up is the hardest thing because we have enough products now where it's like, how if our goal is to have it in stock, how do we like do that? I mean, we have like 15 machines and we have such a great group of engineers to, you know, machinists. And it's like, there's always something you're like, okay, you know, yeah. and I don't know how much... I mean, you have experience with inventory. There's no perfect inventory system. So you're always uncovering the next issue. But so we've really, we've put a lot of like time and effort into like manually watching things. Cause like I said, nobody wants to wait. Like if you're yeah. building a car, you're not going to wait for us to finish it largely to finish your car as a result of it. So, and your whole year kind of waits until black Friday too. Cause you guys now do it's not as much now. Uh, right. uh, it, it used to be that way, but like the benefit of a, kind of a 
I don't know, you want to call it mature business or more mm-hmm. mature business is that people just buy your product when it's not on sale. So. Well, we need it now. I always have this really bad luck about like, for some reason, it's like two days after Black Friday and then I start buying stuff. I don't know why I'm like yeah. not intelligent when it comes to it. I'm not <laughs> proactive enough. Yeah. But I remember your Black Friday sales always used to be a, like a big one. Like yeah. you were waiting. And we you still do, but it's like. Gather inventory. People buy like the week before and I'm like, you know, we for a while we'd have our guys call and be like, you know, it's going on sale next week. I don't care. I just wanted my car done. Like I think if anything, the COVID deal caused that. Like it made people understand like if you need it, you should probably just get it and start working on mm-hmm. it, you know. Yeah, everybody hoped their cars would be done during COVID too. And, and there's still some that aren't. Yeah. Yeah, it happens. Jack it does stands, happen. Jack stands get rusty after a while. You start to look at them, you're like, oh, damn, it's getting bad out here. Yeah, I'm the type, if I'm not going hard at it, I'm not going at it at all. Yeah, so. where is the Nova at right now? What's uh, what's the status uh, on it? I saw it's done painted, and I should have it back in my hands, like, hopefully in the next week or two. Still gray? Still gray. Nice. Yeah, nothing yeah. exotic. No, I like the non-exotic paint colors. Yep. Yeah, people, uh, it's kind of what that car is been known for if i feel like if i change the color i'd turn change the personality so yeah it wouldn't be as cool if you just like made it wild and besides you have el toro and uh (laughs) yeah uh, pumpkin spice well let's be real you can only have one car running at a time unless you have a team of people it's really hard to tough to maintain too because just changing oil it's so annoying fluids maintenance like that's tough i really have to be better about that because i'll even take car parts off cars when I need them. Mm-hmm. But the other day I went to do Garrett's TV show that he, or whatever he was doing slips. Yep. And I, you know, put, uh, what I put something in the Mustang. Oh, I put the fuel pump in the Mustang chip and I was going to go take it, started it up. I was like, cool. Runs good. Click the trans brake button. Nothing. Click it again. Nothing. I have to jack it up in the dirt and find out that the trans brake wire had been cho- chewed mm. through by something. Probably a turtle. It may have been a turtle, but now I have no reverse. Uh, and everybody was like, oh, you don't need a trans brake button, just foot brake. And I'm like, well, that's my reverse, too. Like, I need that. That's why you need an operator shifter. It's got reverse built in. I, I reverse I, switch. I could really use one of those because right now I have this floppy reverse thing on mine, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it broke almost instantly. Mm. Like, I put it in and I did, like, one race. And it was just, like, immediately broken. I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. I was thinking about, like, chop sawing it because it's, like... So damaged, but that thing doesn't really. What do you mean, chop sawing? Like it? cut the parts off, it, oh, yeah. modify it, because reverse click up is broken. Yep. But that car doesn't really deserve it. The Camaro needs some nicer parts. Yeah, it keeps the thing running. Yeah, <laughs> keeps the Camaro running. Chip can just be chip. Yeah, we talked about switching the Camaro's engine to something a little bit heftier. We've been really back and forth. It's really, it's one of those deals where it's like, where do you see classes going in the next five years Mm -hmm. and try to throw your dart to where you're in the front of that class? That's it, because you can't, if you're chasing it, you're behind. Yep. So. That's, like, I talked to Brett and Jim about that, and I'm like, you kind of have to be, like, running for the forefront, and your Nova has been down for a little while. Do you feel like you can come back and, like. Oh, yeah. Be competitive in the stick sh- in the streetcar class right now because it's no because like the reason when I so when I wrecked it uh, I was on the phone literally as we were pulling it back like trying to get a plan together for it because I'm just kind of crazy like that and I was like I want this thing done in sixty days like you see that happen sometimes and I kind of got promised the world and not delivered and then it sat at that same chassis shop for like eight mm-hmm. nine months um, and yeah like now had it got that done and then raced the subsequent season, it probably would have been on top of the world. Yeah. And then I would continue to along with the rest of the people and who knows, maybe had a big block by now, but because it didn't, it's like, okay, where are we at right now? Like, Oh, now I'm going to come out and I'll probably be behind Brett and I'll be behind Garrett and you know, like two or three other people, of course, Tom, but yeah. not that it's the end of the world there. That's why you have different classes, but it's like, but even like the street car right now, like six fifties, or like the 28s, which will be at FL2K will be like extreme 28s will be the fast class now. Yep. But streetcar will probably be like a 7.0 class. Oh, it's insane, yeah. And yes. like that's where that Nova was. It was like in that 7.0, 720 range before. And I'm like, oh, I can get ahead of everybody. And then mm-hmm. now you're like, okay, now I'm just right at, in the middle of the pack. Yeah, so that's where I'm at with my car. I'm like, I got to think about like what we see the next five years looking like. Yep. Because... 
I don't have the ability to keep chasing things every year after year. Like, oh, just change up all this and change up a whole bunch of that stuff. Well, because the reality is when you change stuff, you really just need to start over. Like when you doctor up things, it mm-hmm. doesn't usually work. You know, you're always at close to the limit on like your block, your heads, your transmission. It's like, no, you have to be like dumb enough to say, I'm throwing it all away. I'm going to sell it for 50% of what mm-hmm. I paid for it. And then I'm going to buy all new stuff at full price. And where where do you over. see like the next three to five years of us racing then? I mean, there's a terminal velocity, right? Like Garrett's car is going 650. You know, I've talked with Pete about this. It's like uh, maybe it goes 40s, maybe it goes 30s. But like any faster than that, you're like at it's weight. Like it's not possible with the weight and like the parts available and the power and stuff like that. So it's kind of like radial racing. Radial racing um from the beginning, like the 315, like radio versus the world. I remember when they went 430s and I was like, there'll never be anything faster than that. That's like what Stevie Fast and everybody always said. And then it was like 20s, teens, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s. And like when it got to that like 70s, 60s range, it slowed way down because the cars just physically can't go mm-hmm. any faster. You know, like and then they got to the four, 50s and it was like, it just sat there for a couple of years and the class died. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially what happens. You you race to the finish and then it's done. Yeah, there is like a point where you can't go negative times. You can't defy so. physics and move <laughs> weight faster. Like, And I know it's like kind of the age old thing. Like they said, it could never be done. But like there's literally you can't do it <laughs> at some point. Yeah, I mean, at some point, like you, you're getting closer and closer to zero. Like yeah. you can't. Yeah. Like it, uh, it's got a, a it's got a floor. Yeah, that's somewhere. what's interesting. Like if if you take like Ron Rhodes X275 Camaro, if you pull 400 pounds out of it, it doesn't go four tenths faster like like your Camaro will. Yeah, it goes three one thousands faster. Oh, it picks up a like, number. <laughs> you can't make cars any lighter. You can't make them any faster. So they're just chipping away, and that's when it kind of loses a lot of steam, right? Because you can't like be the guy. You, like you're not the guy to make the next big leap. There's no big leaps to be made at that point. Yeah, I think that's we're definitely getting to that. And the big leaps are so much smaller, yep. but they're so much more expensive. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, I remember the tra- like just transmission costs. What yeah. versus what I used to spend? It's crazy. Well, like my power glide can get me where I'm at right now. Yep. The next jump up from like a five thousand dollar power glide is a twenty thousand dollar lock up three speed. With a six thousand dollar converter to go three tenths, a few numbers faster. Yeah, yeah. three tenths. It's big. It's a huge jump. No- that's it's, a huge jump. It's a huge jump. But then you break everything. But we're also talking about twenty grand. Yeah, <laughs> that's a which is thirty in in car terms. Like, yeah, because the twenty grand and you have to replumb it and re shifter well, yeah, the whole nine. Stuff. Like, yep. I mean, yeah. so it's it, always thirty percent more. It yeah. gets really quick, and then once you take it out, you're like, well, I kind of want to change that, that, and the other thing, and then. Yep. Before you know it, you have a whole different car. Yep. No, I think that's what's so uh, alluring about no prep is because there's no, like, you're literally just racing. It's like playing cards, right? Yeah. You're, like, just going to do the act itself, and there's no, like, final goal. Like, they can no prep race forever because mm-hmm. there's no, they're not chasing a number. Well, you look at, like, beer money, and that, like, on paper, you probably wouldn't think it'd be, I mean, obviously, it's got really nice parts. Yep. But, like visually and like on paper and stuff like it's not a front runner yeah in the any looks class. Depart- department no and then somehow i mean driver behind it is obviously 50 percent of that yep and tuner but like it's a bad machine somehow it just keeps on freaking chugging oh, yeah. away and winning yep i mean he only no. got outrun the other day because the tree deal oh yeah no i mean <laughs> but i think whether people want to hear it or not slick racing is like the next endeavor like getting rid of drag radials mm-hmm. which i i don't want to happen because i love racing on radials but yeah if you went back to slicks right now people would be completely lost like if bradenton stopped doing radial prep and everybody started racing slicks it would be like the wild west yeah well i had justin on no prep kings and their series is insane mm-hmm. like 40 grand to win yep which is just wild in itself. I mean, you you tell somebody forty grand to win a, a class at drag race, and they're gonna definitely not believe you. Yeah. And then they pack the stands. There's no tractors constantly going up and down the yeah. track. It's a show. It's a show. Yeah. The no tractors is a big one because like you and me will when we're not like 
at the racetrack will probably turn on a live feed. Mm -hmm. And what do you see half the time you turn it on? Yeah, tractor racing. There's a tractor going up and down the track. And That's why like, I love Pro Mod racing too, because they'll run the middle of the day, be morning, night, noon, night, mm -hmm. and they run pretty close to the number, and it's exciting to watch. Like I, I, nope. Most people don't want to run on slick because it's not as fun and you can't go as fast. But mm -hmm. at the same time, like it makes a lot of sense. But the slick is nice because if you watch like a big radial race, like the second the tires spin, it's oh, over, done. Yeah, and the race then, is done typically like within the first 150 feet yep if you don't hook right there you're done yep. on a slick tire at least like it could be a battle yeah like who spins the less that's why no can, prep's so exciting who can save it the best like yep. who can kind of keep their car together i i like that aspect because you know you watch i think it was i was watching lights out like whenever the last one was and it was just a spin fest and it was just like that's just like a... Oh, the one where James spun and his nitrous timer shut off. And, and the guy next to him I could spun. Have, I could have ran to the finish line faster than yeah, they both like got down there. 80 miles an hour or yeah. something, but yeah. That's, that's the bad part about... I mean, the best part about radial racing was the times and the effort and the, like, who's going to get there next. Mm -hmm. It was never... The, it's never really been the racing, except for, like, at night in South Georgia or Bradenton. It's pretty cool. That's kind of the thing that they always say is, like, the vampire racing. Yeah. Once yeah. the lights turn on is when everybody kind of comes out of their trailers. But it's horrible in terms of, like... I mean, you're tired when you're running final round. Like, really tired. Yeah. I've been to a couple, thankfully, final rounds, and I'm like, man... I want to go home. Yeah, like, I don't even care if I win or lose. I just want to go home at this point. There's not I've, enough monsters in the world to get me through this. I've been at one race before where I was like, I was potentially going to win, and I was still debating on leaving because it was so hot, humid, and brutal out. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm straight up not having a good time right now. <laughs> Dude, Great Ben, last year at the end of Rocky Mountain Race Week, they had like a shootout. And it was like 120 degrees and the wind was blowing. So it was like a pressure cooker. I literally was like thinking about like losing just so I could go home. Mm -hmm. But like Red like slammed on a fender and I thought we had a pretty good tune up in it. So I kept racing and won a couple rounds. But I was like, yeah, it's, there's those times where you're like, that's when racing's not fun. Mm -hmm. so. But then you come back and you're working on your car and you're like, oh, I can't wait to do that again. And you're like, exactly. wait. I was not having a good time that day. <laughs> Nostalgia is what ruins and makes everything. Like, you remember the good things, forget the bad things. Yeah, that definitely helps a lot. So five years and ten years of the car industry. I am I obviously think about the future a lot, maybe to the detriment. Mm -hmm. But, where, like, obviously you have to think about the future because mm -hmm. you have a brand you're building. What do you, like... I mean, we're still buying companies. Like Just the, full steam ahead. If you think back to, like, the... Say, let's just go back to 1974. They mm -hmm. thought it was all over then. Oil crisis. And, yeah, the oil crisis, that was when, like, all the mission stuff started to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you had that, like, 70s and 80s lull, but people were still racing during that time. And, like, now with YouTube and everything, there's so much exposure about how much fun racing is as a community and racing. I think it's not going to go away. Like, I think there's enough, um, there's enough momentum. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, like, there's going to come become a time and point, time in, in, in society when people realize how dumb EVs are. Like, is it a technology that you could also use? Yes. Is it something we can replace internal combustion engines with? Heck no, dude. Like, there's not a grid for it. If you look at the actual emission, like, if people ever got smart enough to look at the real, like long-term imprint of production yeah. and usage they would be like okay this is obviously just like propaganda but you know that's i think you'll see it come back around again and i don't know that it'll ever go away you know so um and i i largely think that no matter how it evolves like they're never going to steal racing from our souls like look at australia and all these countries that have uh really really strict emissions loss they're still racing at the track they're still even doing drag challenge and stuff like that um yeah and they're on the stricter side of things oh if they if they even catch you without the original wheels on your car you're in big trouble you know so like my mustang would be safe and i i really think that uh i think the the good people in the world will prevail and you know you'll have they'll realize that they can't take every fun thing from everybody yeah so. eventually something has to give oh yeah and I run ethanol, so I run corn-based fuel anyways. I don't even, not reliant on oil, maybe to yeah. get there, yep. <laughs> to get to the track. <laughs> yeah, and like you said earlier, it's like, we're all about, I mean, I think everybody benefits if, like, 
my towing vehicle and my drag week vehicle and all that stuff improve fuel mileage or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like we all benefit from that. Yeah. The EV stuff is weird because in Florida we have natural disasters where you run out of power. Yeah. Getting gas is usually a lot easier than getting electricity. I mean, we were, our neighborhood was out of power for maybe five days after the storm. Yeah. Several days. Yeah. That's pretty significant. Yeah. I made a comment about that and it wasn't very happily accepted by anybody. I was like, good luck getting away from it with your EVs. And I got like scolded about it. I'm like, well, I'm sorry you're emotional about it, but I'm being realistic. Yeah, the, I do think it's like I ride a scooter that's electric powered at the racetrack. It has yeah. its use. What Does it the, have uh, its use everywhere? No. Facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah. <laughs> that that classic one. And it's true because they they don't, especially in that situation. Like if if my house is on fire, I don't want a electric powered fire truck showing up. I really don't. You mean the ones that have Cummins six seven motors in them to charge the batteries? Yeah, those they ones. run full time. Those ones. Yeah, I've seen those. There's not. There's not. I don't think there is a purely EV emergency vehicle. They're all hybrids, really. Not yet, and but they won't call them hybrids because they don't want that to be. You know, EV doesn't even bother me as much as DEF does. <laughs> oh DEF, my gosh, that is like a peak frustration for me because I would love. I would love so to see bad. the list of senators and politicians who invested in the def companies you mean peak i think it's just i think i think they have made the best investment ever yeah because if you think about def there's one brand that comes to mind oh yeah it's about the only one out there and i don't know if they were told beforehand everything happened like hey you guys should uh you know, start making def because it's gonna really boom here soon exactly that's what i mean like who owns peak <laughs> Somebody is well established in that it's, because it's like that. That's one of those DEF is one of those things. I don't even have to do the math to break down the feasibility of it actually being better for the environment because it's not like you're mm -hmm. like somehow they have to produce this in a factory that they built. They have to transport it. It's made of plastic and cardboard and then you have to pour it in and you get like I don't even know if it gets better fuel mileage. Plus you have like these components that use the DEF. That, yep. How hard are those to produce and what factories are needed? And they have like 18,000 converters inside that do it. And you're like, okay. And then you throw the jug outside to AutoZone and who knows where it goes. Like probably ends up in a creek behind it. Yep. Trying to explain it to anybody yeah. and not sound like you're being sarcastic is is difficult in itself. Like try to explain DEF to somebody that like they're normal people that don't have a tow rig or yeah. deal with diesel trucks, try to explain it. And you realize quickly, you're like, wait, this sounds like satire. Oh yeah. This sounds like a, uh, like a prank. Honestly, that's kind of why I backed off the EV stuff a little bit. Uh, I used to make, you know, I made a lot of jokes about yeah. it. People cannot handle it. Like you're like, well, the electricity is not made by unicorn farts. So like, mm -hmm. but people would be like, it's a wave of the future. Like, well, you're not bringing any facts to the table, but I guess it's not for me to convince anybody and social media is the wrong place to try and convince anybody of anything. So if anybody thinks like a 6,000 pound electric vehicle to get them to the grocery store and back is the most economical way of using energy, then they're crazy because it's a 6,000 pound vehicle. Yep. Like if you had an electric Vespa and you were like, this is what I use to commute, I'd be like, that's good for the environment that's fine yep. <laughs> and, well uh, the other thing is like they spent the last couple decades just trying to ruin nuclear energy which is probably the most feasible me, yep. one of the most feasible energy source uh it just makes people not feel good inside and then they so now they're a lot they basically push everybody back to coal because the wind and mm -hmm. stuff was not feasible those things are just catching on fire and falling over and it's like okay so now we're just kind of back to like running in a circle like you said, I don't care what people drive, and then that was never my intent of making fun of EVs. But like, yeah, I mean, let's if people want to drive an EV, like I, like one hundred percent, I don't drive that much every day. Yeah. I would drive an electric vehicle yeah. because I don't drive that much every day. Yeah, I know. But I then mean, I would continually I mean, make have fun my of truck. I would make fun of you. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. fair. I, I get made fun of for a lot of things. I can. <laughs> I have thick <laughs> enough skin. When you drive by my house, I'd be laughing at you. But <laughs> I have thick enough skin to handle it, so I'm okay with that. I'm I'm like intrigued by the other alternate energies, like water, like steam power. Like mm -hmm. I've seen. I did like a lot of. I mean, base level research on it in college when I was. I went to school for engineering the first couple of years, and like 
that intrigued me. Like hydrogen, all yeah. that stuff. Like, and none of them are going to be easy to convert to because our whole world is built around gas stations. So like the the deadlines they're putting on stuff, it's like what uh, what's going on here? Like it's the problem with politics right now is everything is like four years at a time. It goes this way, then it goes this mm-hmm. way, then it goes this way, and then, you know. Well, the funny thing is, what I tell people is like, Toyota probably the best auto manufacturer ever. Yep. Got it right 10 years ago. And yep. they came out with the Prius. And yep. those things are still on the road. Gen oh, yeah. 1 Priuses are still on the road. Saving. I just saw one drive by on the way here. And I was like, dang, workhorse. You know? Yeah, like they're probably like 400,000 miles on them. And they're still just like the that level of like hybrid, like the gas and the electric together yep. is the best way to do it. Oh, yeah. And any plug-in electric is Probably not the best, but then those Priuses just keep kicking. Can you imagine an EV boat or airplane for like the most polluting thing on the environment and those yeah. are not being focused on? Like that that just blows my mind. I saw like the- boats get 0.8 miles a gallon and planes just spew massive mm-hmm. amounts of fuel no matter what. I saw the best thing and it was like a shipping container boat and it was like, we have a new technology to help these things get apart. And it was a sale. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We're, it's like, I feel like I've seen this before. <laughs> so I'm saying, like, with the racing world, like, it comes back around. Like, and everybody's, like, never going to be a muscle car again. And then we have the coolest muscle cars on the planet. Yeah. Like, the technology is, like, nothing compares in the old days to, to this. So Dodge know. coming out with nine seconds out of the box cars, even though. I saw I, a new C8 Z06 go, like, 980 out of the box. Yeah. It's nuts. Those things are sick, too. And then the E-Ray seems kind of cool, too, which is the hybrid electric deal. But Dodge kind of did a a lot of great things. And then something seems to have happened above their head Mm -hmm. that stopped that from happening. Yeah, There's there's always something breathing down your neck that's stopping you from doing that. And you just never know. You just got to follow the money. Well, I want to keep talking, but I got to pee. Do you have any um like weird guilty pleasures of automotive that's like completely separate of drag racing that you watch? Like I'm sure you're not a NASCAR guy or like F1 can be interesting. Drifting, I watch FD a little bit. I got a uh, really bad like ADD, so I really struggle to even watch drag racing if I'm not actually at the track. Yeah. So not really. <laughs> Just kind of stay in your own lane on that deal. Yeah, and I like hate to say it, but I mean, if I'm not racing or working on my own car or working on one of the motion TBM cars, like I just kind of lose, you know, I just mm-hmm. like lose it. So which I, I think leads to the understanding of like why some events are really good and some aren't. Like you have to captivate the audience, and yeah. a lot of motorsports doesn't do well at that. No matter how cool the vehicle or boat or plane or whatever is. You get a really small window to drag someone in. Yep. It's the same with YouTube. You get like the first 10, 15 seconds to really captivate them. Yep. And once you kind of got them, they are yours for a little while. But then it's it's a definitely a tough one on that deal. Yeah, it's kind of like I'm a big like Gary V fan. And he talks about like the WWE or WWF, whatever it is. Yep. Like, there's nothing really that cool about what they're doing, but they've created a hype and excitement around it. And like, if every form of racing or entertainment was like that, it would all do better. You it's know, it's funny you say that because I've made that comparison quite a few times to yep. like what Vince McMahon did was took this very normal form. Like wrestling is just like an old, and sport. you know it's fake. Yeah, <laughs> like, and he just made him freaking famous and filling stadiums for doing it. And he's been doing it for 20 years, 30 years doing that. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, I think there's a, um, the having a race, racing, having a track, promoting like is a very difficult thing. So I think it's, a, it's easy to forget that component mm-hmm. of it. But it's also about like making the, making the cars, the, or like the people that drive the cars, like the, the show, making that like the thing. Yep. And that's a big important thing is like, us as racers almost need to be our self-promotion to get people in the stands because the more people in the stands, the better it is for your sponsors. 100%. Like it's a team effort. Yeah. It's like, and without the personalities kind of pushing that, it doesn't happen. Like honestly, probably the last race that I really watched that was like your guilty pleasure was back before Garrett was an owner of motion. Uh, I watched the first ever crown Vic race and I was like, Mm -hmm. just enthralled by the, dumpster fire that was happening you know people you know 
It's yep. exciting. It's unpredictable. And I was like, dang, this is crazy. And that's why it's continued to be successful. It's not the car. It's not the like stadium per se. It's just like the fact of what they're doing and the personalities. So much unpredictability. Monster Jam is like a very similar, I mm -hmm. think you could call like a, a study, like a case study yep. on like what puts people in the seat, what gets kids in the seats yep. and like the excitement factor. People spend 80 bucks to go to like per ticket to go to some of those like monster. Yeah, they want to get a picture stuff. in front of Gravedigger, and which has like, TBM brakes, by the way. TBM brakes on there. <laughs> yeah, because they're not far from here. Yeah, they're just down the road. But they've always, uh, I don't I don't know the exact number of years, but I think like the last 10 or 15 years, they've only ran TBM brakes on every monster truck. Yeah, that's pretty cool. They're a good case study of like, they don't care about like the competition really. Like I guess people do win, but they like, do have it's competition, even, but nobody like, even knows it's happening. That's not even the thing. Like yep. nobody cares about that. Yep. And even WWE is interesting because they're like the biggest YouTube channel ever. Yep. They have like ninety thousand videos on their YouTube channel, and then their videos get like twenty million views each or something like that. Yeah. Honestly, love him or hate him, Donald Long, yeah, came to fame because of he basically implemented that exact same thing. He created heroes. Foes, you know, thrones like that he rivalries, the thrones. He puts on a show. Like he, I mean, there's a case study behind it. He definitely elevated radial tire racing a and lot. small tire just in general. Yep. yep, he did. He did a lot for that. You cannot take that away from him. Yep, I, he's polarizing by design. Yep, it's not like a <laughs> yeah. And I suspect if you hung out with him, which I'm, I don't know him really, but uh, I'm suspect he wouldn't be like that in person. No, I don't know, Donald. If you're if you're listening or anybody talks, I'd love to have you on the podcast. You should definitely point. come on. You here. should come yeah. on and be fun. I'd love to hear from my boy Coop's got some questions. He's wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, his stuff is really cool. And then just what Gary does, I think the Christmas tree race is another great case study of like yep. nobody cares about the competition. Like you don't really care who won at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. You just have fun because you went and saw some racing that is weird and yep. like. But but what's really great about the racing world and why I think it'll continue to thrive outside of like my self fulfilling prophecy of like I have a car com or automotive company <laughs> is that like invested. if you love like family style racing you go over here if you love the like dumpster fire you go over here if you, you know there's so many outlets yeah. to like fulfill that and I think people find their way and navigate through it that there's just it's almost unending you know whereas like a lot of other hobbies it's hard to do that with so. Yeah, and like in drag racing, you can get involved and suddenly be like, you know, a name and like the top of it. Whereas like if you watch professional sports, you're you're not watching sports and then suddenly going to be a quarterback. Yeah, it's not. There's no there's no path yeah. there, but you can watch a pro mod and then suddenly five years down the line, you make the right choices. You like, are driving a pro mod, which can be the wrong choice. <laughs> yes, they call them gentlemen be. drivers, and a lot of times they're quite dangerous. Yes, but some of them end up being good drivers. Yeah. Like some of them are just yeah. But but by design, like you're supposed to go up through the ranks. You should, you should. <laughs> but it's yeah. weird too because not a lot. Of, like the ranks are way different now because a seven second car. There's nothing really. I don't know. The ranks to get to Pro Mod are a little weird because a radial tire car, no matter how fast you're going, is going to be so different than a big tire Pro mm -hmm. Mod. But the experiences and like yeah. being aware and everything, like you can't buy a lot of that. Like, yep. you know, when you first time you put a car into your competitor's lane, you learn lessons like how just, you know, whether it's internal or external, like you know what to do. You should definitely, uh, you know, that's why I kind of gave five years a little buffer. Maybe, you know, you start in like a top sportsman or yes. something at least. There like, definitely should be some type of like progress. I think that for, with top fuel, I think you have to do a progression. I don't think you can go from like not racing, to having no license to right there. But yeah, it could I could be wrong. I'm sure there's something to get through there. But yeah. you can. OK, so if you're watching streetcar class and watching me go down, you can do that relatively quickly. You can write a sixty thousand dollar check. To the right person, and you could be door to door with me mm -hmm. that weekend. Yep, <laughs> it's very quick progression on that deal. Yep. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's good and bad. It's good it, and bad. Yeah, we've had both, but then the um, the Christmas tree race is one of my favorites because the people are just there to watch the cars go down. They don't care yeah. about the competition. That's I think the best type of racing at the end of the day. Like it, everybody kind of 
I don't know. It's it's a lot of racing needs to be fun at the end. Like, like you can't just be competition. It needs to be fun also because if it becomes a chore or a hobby, mm-hmm. you just don't. It's easy to be like, nah, I'll do this instead. And I've been there before. Yeah, when it becomes a yeah, that's tough because you want it to be fun, but you also some people's competitive side takes over way too much. And my competitive side is not as aggressive as most, mm-hmm. so I can still enjoy yeah. any loss or anything like that. Like, I'm not going to lose and get so frustrated that I load up and head out before, like, I watch other people go. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Some yeah. people are like, they lost their, you know, loading up. They're in the way of other people trying to, like, pull up to the lanes, and they don't care. They're just frustrated leaving. Yeah, but it's like anything in life. It takes all kinds. Yeah, it's definitely there's that competitive level. So, um recently i saw you guys were talking about gary isn't that your, oh, yeah. your robot Gary the robot yep how um how much robotics can you really implement into the machining world um i think it can be looked at a couple different ways like the brake company for instance is perfect because we're always going to make calipers and it's our it's in every kit mm-hmm. so that was like we've been wanting to do it for a while do automation for a while but that was like our no brainer, you know, the thing like right now it's a running brake calipers. There's nobody at the shop. Mm-hmm. So it'll go. It doesn't take Memorial Day weekend off. It doesn't take weekends off. Uh, it doesn't call in soon. Not even Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a tough break. Yeah. Tough boss. <laughs> it is. But uh, like we load it up on Friday and then when we come back on Monday, it's already done. But it's ran 54 hours, I think, of machining uh, from Friday when we leave till when we get there. Yeah. So it's incredible. It's changed our business. But. There's other products where I'm like, we need a robot for that, but then we just need to be able to push it out of the way mm-hmm. just so it can burn through like huge amounts of production. The problem with robots is they're not easily adaptable, um, or at least not in their current state. So like for us to do, you know, one of our other 300 products at Motion, we don't sell enough of one given product to justify it. So that's, that's kind of like the area we're in right now. Um, you know, you're you're doing it just to basically get more done in a given t- period mm-hmm. of time. But if but they take a long time to set up. So if they take a bunch of time to set up and you don't make any extra ground they're by the time cheap, it runs. I imagine, too. No, they're very expensive. So they're a very tough logistical thing to make. But I think there's a place for them, you know. And if we develop a couple markets deeper, we'll be able to use it more. So. Yeah, I've seen some cool ones. Like uh, I think it's Boston Dynamics has a couple cool like box moving ones that yep. fit on a pallet. Yep. Those ones seem like they could be good if you got like heavy stuff. Yeah. And they have the little dog that can run around. and Yeah. Like... The interesting thing about robots is, like, every day you find a new, like, variable that's like, oh, gosh, I would have never thought of that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, there's a ch- – like, we probe every part when it comes off. So it gets all the quality checks, and the one day there's, like, a chip that it didn't blow the chip off, so it touched it and thought the part was bad. So then it shut down, and we lost – you know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very uh, – I'm sure we could – in five years, we'll probably have a whole team that does nothing but robotics uh, manufacturing, whether it's race car parts or something else. Yeah. And do you have to, like, invest in your team at that point to know how to manage that stuff? And, like, I mean, even your brother Andy had to, like, invest in himself to learn all the machining. Yeah. It's kind of a similar thing. You have to now yeah. learn yeah. robotics. Yeah. I mean, we had meetings. I just had a meeting the other day with my guys, and I was like, we need to develop a team for robotics. <laughs> like... It's just a whole new endeavor, and it's it takes somebody who's solely focused on that. Mm-hmm. But the it's like any other investment it will eventually pay off. Yeah. yeah, you have to look way down the line for some stuff, and that's where it's so tough because you got to look down at your own feet, and then you also have to look down at the road and that's know where a, you're going. That's the tough part about business is like I have things happening right in front of my face. Like, hey, I should I see this guy that needs tech support online. You know, I need to probably reply to him, but I'm also like trying to do these things that are six months, a year, two years down the road Mm -hmm. subsequently, and you're, like, making decisions off both off of what the other thing is causing you or doing for you at that time. Yeah, it's so tough because you have to be, like, macro and then also, like, yeah, (laughs) thinking about all of it. Yeah, that seems like a really really fun way to go about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't really... There's, I don't care what classes you take. There's no preparation for that. It's just dealing with it. So. Yeah, you just have to be thrown into it completely because mm-hmm. before you owned a business, you were selling medical equipment, right? Yeah, my old, my only thing I was doing was selling a product that was already FDA approved and talking to surgeons. You know, now it's like, yeah, there's a lot of dynamics. Do you have to deal with any, like, approval on any of your parts? 
We have uh, like our quick release is SFI certified. Mm-hmm. Um, our diapers were NHRA and IHRA appro- approved, and sometimes you get into that stuff, but it's yeah, pretty easy. It's pretty easy to navigate compared to the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, I'd imagine for medical equipment. Yeah, the SFI stuff seems a little tough to. NHRA seems more difficult than SFI. I feel like. Uh, they're pretty easy to work with. I mean, they kind of spell out what they want, and you just have to like you know, invest the engineering into doing it. I mean, another thing is like that is like patents and stuff. You know, if you want to track and protect your intellectual property, it's it's a tough to navigate thing, you know. Is it worth doing for the most part? Because I feel like for some of it, it's not even worth doing if yeah. you trust your engineers to continually innovate. Yeah. Because by the time you I think the jury's do... out on that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like you said, it's as... If you're relying on one product for the next 20 years versus, you know, pointing and or running and gunning and doing new things all the time, you're, there's an argument that could be made against it or for it, I guess. So Yeah, that's where it would get tricky because if somebody's copying you and by the time they even copy you, you could be already moved on from it. And are you going to fight a lawsuit because those are slow moving anyways? Oh, yeah. The, the file, the, pa- the paperwork to file it, the process, the legal. I mean, the only mm. people who make money on that are the attorneys. I mean, let's be honest. So, uh, but, you know, that's kind of our whole concept is just like, we're already on, we're 10 steps down the road. Like literally we, some of the parts we're releasing now, we've been developing for like 12 to 18 months, two years. Mm-hmm. And right now we're starting projects that will release in two years so it's like if you are constantly looking behind you it just you're gonna get run over do people watch your videos and like spy shot things they're like oh i, I see uh, you know like surprisingly not as much as you would think like and they pop up in videos because when we do you're... dragon drives like i put all of our like new parts on because i'm like what better way to break it than mm-hmm. what we're doing here and people don't catch it i'm like it's interesting. Yeah, that's funny that they don't even catch it and just like yeah, because it is like spy shots. You need to like wrap things like <laughs> yeah, and you can guarantee if I'm doing a drag and drive, I'm testing some new parts. Cause yeah, I, I'm like what? There's no better testing. Yeah, and then you worry like you can test it on Garrett's car, but if it's a new part that you don't want people to see yet, yeah, that may be the wrong place to test it because oh yeah, if it does have an issue, it's it, exposed to the world, and yeah. he has to talk about it. Yeah, like I'm in the same way, like. You know, like if yep. a company sends me something and I use it and it has an issue, I, I'm i not in the business of hiding stuff. Because it's your integrity. Yeah, like. People are going to find out, too. Yep. They're pretty smart. Well, and, and I think, like, I, I think accepting your problem is a good thing. Like, for instance, Mullet ha- ate a throttle body screw the one time. Yeah. That's not a unique problem to us. I mean, like. I, he posted it and everybody's like, don't be like, don't be so hard on yourself. Like even factory throttle bodies do that. They'll drop a throttle body screw out. Like, yep. Just. It's the design. It's the concept. So then we started welding them on the back. But like that, almost that publicity kind of pushed us to find the best solution possible, Mm -hmm. you know, and implement it because it's like, well, I don't want to have this happen again. I didn't intend for it to happen in the beginning. I didn't do anything negligent, but I sure don't want it to happen again. So like sometimes the best things come from bad mistakes. Yeah, minor failures like that happen. You should have had an intercooler there and it wouldn't have happened. (laughs) By the way, there are some parts on Mullet right now that don't exist in our catalog that nobody has caught. So oh, it's pretty really? interesting, yeah. So if you guys are watching, you can go really hunt around on something. <laughs> Good luck, but it's uh it's yeah, it's a platform to test. So. I've seen James test a few things too. I've been at the track with James and he begs for us to send him stuff yeah. to test. He loves that stuff. Well, he changes his cars quickly enough too. Yep. Yep. He's one of the fastest people I've ever seen to change combos. Like one weekend it'll be twin turbo. Then he's like, ah, oh, I got this single turbo and, like, change up the whole car. James is the opposite of you and partly me. Like, that dude does take it personal, and he will leave early, and he will. Yes. He does take, like, he, if he loses, he is mad, <laughs> and he's going to change. He will, he doesn't have any, like, attachment to anything. He will change everything and adapt. Yep. Yeah. Except for was... the front struts on the 240. I hope he's watching because <laughs> I've been on him to, like, fix that front suspension. It's a little wonky up there. It's terrifying, man. And that yeah. wheelie and the darty. Yeah, I'm, and him and Lyle are the most unafraid race car drivers I've ever seen. Like, if something's not right, I'm, like, not racing until it's fixed. And those two guys will just be like, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting on front shocks for my Camaro, and I haven't raced it because why bother until you 
put new parts on it or change something. Mm -hmm. But James will add more power before he makes it not try to change lanes on him. Oh, yeah. I've let James drive like my Nova before. And he's like, oh, yeah, what? New personal best. I was like, how much boost is that? He's like, 45 pounds. I'm like, I've never run it. How did you get 45 pounds? I told you not to turn it. Well, it's scramble. I'm like, I didn't even know I had a scramble hooked up anymore. <laughs> he will always add three pounds of boost in two mm -hmm. degrees of timing. Yeah, he's kind of like stuck in Gonzo's car, the, the yeah. Camaro that yeah. everybody always says is that my car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and photos, people are like, that Cooper's car? Yeah. And if you've ever seen the car in person, you know damn well that's not my car. <laughs> that thing is 50 steps ahead of kind of like the any you versus car. the guy she tells you not to worry about yes. situation. Yeah. And there's been comments like, your car could have looked like that. I'm like, no, it couldn't nope. have. Nope, I remember it in the beginning. It could not have looked like that. No, not many Camaros I mean, it could have. Yeah, that thing is incredible. Well, my car, 300,000 miles on when yeah. I got it. Yeah. Gonzo got his off the showroom New. floor. Yeah, yeah. Never, it never saw the progression that yours saw. Completely different realm. Yeah. That yeah. car is just, like, immaculate. Like, sh should be, like, one of those, like, sits in the summit and just, like, mm -hmm. goes around. Goes in circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one of those deals should just be on display and sits there. Yep. Titanium everything. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, that's a that's a good look. I actually car. got those two connected. No, most people don't know. Yeah, he was a customer of ours, and he's like, "I need a driver." I was like, "I got the guy for you." That was a bold move to connect oh. James into a nitrous <laughs> car. Yeah, I think I, I think people can respect and know James enough to like, uh, like he's a hell of a driver. He mm -hmm. needs a good car to drive. You know, it's, well, it it's hard out. to be both. It worked out really well too because Nate came along with James. Yep, and Gonzo also needed a tuner. Yep to come to the track with them and to help them on that level of it because, you know, a driver only does so much and yeah. the guy that helped pushes the car up to the lanes can only do so much when you don't have your tuner there. Got to have everything, man. Yeah, that is, Ultra Street is a tight competition. Yeah, it is not for the faint of heart. No, I have no desire for it. But they're, I mean, they're almost going now as fast as Radio vs. the World did in 2012, 13, mm -hmm. so... 14, whatever year it was. Relatively but. heavy cars, too. Oh, yeah. They're cool. Yeah, that's a good class. It's it's competitive. Do you get excited for other people's cars as much as you get excited oh, yeah. for yours? Oh, I yeah. find myself doing that. I'm like, like other people's cars are almost done, and I'm like, I just want to go to the track and watch that one. Yeah. Like, I mean, especially our customers. I just, like, I love it. You know, like, uh, People like Kenny Hubbard, he's like, he calls me all the time, like on the weekend, you know, on a Monday or whatever, like, car just went this. And I like, I love following it. I yeah. mean, it's a Nova, of course, but like, I love following the progression. Reds, yep. like Justin Martin, a lot of those guys. Just a um, lot of fun to watch people do well. I'm a big fan of Kenny. He's a, he's a pretty awesome racer to watch. He's won like yep. every, <laughs> he, yeah, he, he wins way more. Like, he's probably got like a 95% win streak in his class. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's an exceptional see. human being, too. Like, he'll be literally cooking everybody lunch out of his own pocket, like, for 30, 40 people. And then, like, 10 minutes later, you're like, how are you in the lanes in your car right now? And then he'll win the race, and then he'll come back and, like, cook people more food. And if somebody's car is broken, he'll help. Them. I'm like, yeah. dude, that guy is a uh, energy machine. And they run two cars. They yeah, run him it. and his daughter, yeah. and she's becoming very dominant, and that car is impressive as well. So yeah, they're we just a, a cool family. When we were in Orlando, she treated James and... Oh, big time. Yeah. <laughs> he left really quickly. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I didn't even call James that next week. I'm just like, I'll leave that one alone. Yeah. We were we were all together up there at the top end of Orlando, and he was like, he's like, yep, yeah, gone. I was yeah. like, I don't blame you. <laughs> at least she outran him, too, so he... He at least couldn't be too hard on himself. He didn't have a chance. Yeah, he said they were at the top end, and she was, like, celebrating, like, oh, that was my first double O, and he's just like, ah, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James is, uh, he's rarely going to cheer for you, but it's not because he doesn't like you. It's just, he's just very competitive. Yeah, I mean, that's the early bracket racing and stuff kind of drives that into you. I think that's the best way to start Yep. in cars is bracket racing. I didn't get that luxury of, like, starting racing early enough yep. same and, here i didn't start till i was like 17 and i was like you know not that you can't do well because but yeah yeah at that point you're not going to want to like get into me a lot of people will but like you wanted to get into like heads up racing yeah so you're not going to like cut your teeth on bracket racing yeah to get the experience that you kind of need people 
give bracket racing a hard time, but it's in it's if you can like go be at a bracket race. Number one, the cars they build are phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, they operate under a certain boundary. You know, they're trying to run a number and not trying to go the fastest. But the drivers there, if they came over to heads up racing, everybody'd be in big trouble. For big sure, big trouble. Like if you put some like good bracket racers and heads up cars, and then like you just gave them the car to race, like. That would not be good. Well, they're consistent. They can turn cars around. And that's like what it teaches you so well Mm -hmm. is like that process of like doing the same thing over and over again. And Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. So, you know, it took me a long time to be up there and actually do things similar. Oh, yeah. Because you don't get 20 passes in a a small tire radial car, you know, like every pass. Every pass, you know, in the back of your mind, like, okay, I get one less now on everything. Yep. And it just like it's this like check mark that you know. In a lot of senses, like I think I feel like heads up, small tire, or whatever you want to call it, like they were like, oh crap, now I have to drive. How do I cut a light? You know what I mean? Whereas mm-hmm. these guys are focusing on driving. Yeah, it takes some time to uh, get used to all that. Because even me, sometimes like I'll get caught up in thinking about something else after my burnout, where I'm thinking about something on the car. Yep. And then that'll screw me up so much, or my staging is just a little different. Yep. And you're trying to like play games a little bit with the guy next to you, but not too much. Yep. And that kind of that gets fun though. Yeah, so. I think I think uh, in a perfect world, a racing team has like a driver, a tuner, a builder, hmm. because like when when Lyle got put in pro mod racing, I mean he won multiple events, you know, big events, and a car that was slow comparatively. Yeah. So it's like. James, the same way, I always say, like, if somebody just put him in a, a winning car where he, I mean, he's literally building his car while holding on the ham bone and, you know, helping out around the house. Like, you can't, if you don't fo- if you can't, don't have the time to focus on it and you're building a car, you know, at 2 in the morning, it's just hard to do all the things. Well, I was at the track with James the other day, and he had a, a kid that morning. Oh, yeah. Had his third kid yeah. that morning. He's going through his head while he's racing. And then he won the no time shootout that night. <laughs> I know. It's, he sent me that text. I'm like, dude, what? That's wild. I'm like, yeah, my wife would not be cool with that. <laughs> if I just left the hospital, that would not fly. And he's like, I went to the hospital, left the hospital and went racing. Yeah, that was Amber's a special person in that regard for sure. Oh, man, that was pretty funny. So uh, the building cars is definitely the uh, toughest part. I've had to learn more things off of, like, building and working on my own cars than I ever had imagined. Yep. Like, there is no preparedness that can prepare you for, like, all right, now I'm going to build a car that makes 500 horsepower. Yeah. And you will learn so much. You're learning so by quickly. from your mistakes, yeah. It's like, definitely, um, it's probably the most fun experience to build a car from scratch on jack stands yep and i'm sure you have so many customers it goes back to like being proud and excited of your own customers Mm -hmm. yeah it's fun to watch like our customers go from everybody calls everybody's got a story but then like the best part about social media i know a lot of people are hard on it is i get to watch that and then like you said then they go out and you're like you watch them go fast and you're like dude that is awesome Mm -hmm. like you're literally you just jump 10 steps in life just by like trying hard and doing that. And, uh, you know, and I, I just got a lot of respect for people that kind of bootstrap a car or whatever business doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, and that's yeah. honestly how we developed almost every single part. That's why we kind of play in our bounds of like the style racing we do, because that's how we come up with parts when you're building a car and you get frustrated. Yeah. We just get to take it to the next level. That's where all innovation comes from right there is yeah. the hatred of something that you came across yeah write it down and actually do something about it yeah there's uh like our little wastegate merges i've always wanted those and it took like Mm -hmm. six years in business to be able to bring that to fruition and now it's like okay well that problem solved what's next yeah those are a cool one those are a nice uh super clean deal i'm sure those blew up yeah no yeah they're huge Uh, you know just uh, that was i thought about that for six years just like i wish Mm -hmm. there was something better what cars are coming out that you're pretty excited about? I'm sure there's some you got your eye on. We're getting close to a lot of people's racing season. We're our Florida season's pretty much at a standstill. It's cooked, yeah. But we're getting close to most of the country being in racing season. Yeah, I don't know. I I feel like there's just so much stuff I like to watch at any given time that it's hard to put put your put my thumb on it. Yeah. I'm excited about the OBS truck. That's like 
it's one of the slower cars that we have or will be and it's still exciting so. yeah i mean you guys were so excited about your burnout car the same way where it's like oh yeah it's everybody should build a burnout car like junk it, and put thrown together and somehow it's the most exciting car mm-hmm. yeah, like I, I don't find it to be the most fun car now but it was definitely a lot of fun like just taking all the old parts we had and putting mm-hmm. them together it's got a flex sealed cage in it. Oh yeah, yeah. Didn't you make it on a flex seal commercial? <laughs> I think they. Uh, they yeah, they to... definitely put it on their social media, and I, I think maybe I, we may have made it on a commercial. I don't know. They <laughs> were pretty great. excited about it. Oh, that's a good deal. But now, full blown Florida man. Any plans on uh, motion boats? No, I mean it probably wouldn't be a bad market. You probably not, have a lot of parts on boats that you don't even realize, too. Oh, yeah. I could think, like, Torchcraft that does Garrett's boats, they put, like, a lot of our parts on every one mm-hmm. of them, like, from flex fuel sensors to catch cans and stuff like that. But uh, I just I have a really hard time playing in a realm that I don't have passion for. Like, we launched that side-by-side division, and mm-hmm. I enjoyed side-by-sides, but, I, like, once I did it, I just could not do it again for three months. So I... I I really let the business kind of, you know, fizzle out or whatever you want to call it. And it was just like hard to keep pushing forward and go there on the weekend when you have other things you can do. Yeah. And you're competing with kind of the same thing that we were talking about, the dropship. And like, that's those people's like passion and livelihood. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of just like trying to get your toes wet in it. Yep. That it's almost like stay in your lane because you can't why comp- spread yourself that thin. Exactly. You cannot compete against somebody that's passionate about what they're doing. Like mm-hmm. you just can't. And I think that's why, like, these big corporations buying all these parts companies, they're going to not do well in the long term because they're trying to make money. They're not, like, focused on the passion behind it. So I think I, I'm kind of tying stuff together, but I think, like, that leaves a lot of opportunity for people who want to start an automotive-focused business to, like, succeed. Because yeah. anytime the big people get involved, it loses touch with reality, you know? Well, there's a lot of, like, cool manufacturers more popping up now because of yeah. the I think you guys kind of champion this push a lot is the US made. Yep. And a lot of people are becoming very anti overseas made parts, which is helping the US manufacturers that those parts that are now over being made overseas, they can't really come back. Yeah. They're kind of stuck there because their margins yep. and because What's what's really interesting about that, and I've like the last six months I've been trying to help some people who are doing that, and I, I find a lot of joy in that, like not even making money, but like just sharing. Yeah. Like Ryan Frazier, for instance, FFP Customs, like he's building all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, you he's know? only like 30 minutes from me. Yeah, he's, and he's the nicest guy on the planet. I'm like, so I've been like trying to bring awareness to his products without any like return for me out of the deal, but it's it's cool to see, but... The dynamic that's interesting about like overseas manufacturing versus here, which I felt like I was really against it originally, the overseas manufacturing just kind of like in a prideful way. Yeah. In a way, it's good because it, it used to bring like inexpensive parts. So it would bring new people into racing. And then, of course, they're going to evolve and want nicer stuff that's not, you know, overseas made or whatever. But like now, all of those big companies that bought all those little companies and are they're, they're getting greedy. So like their prices are the same and people are realizing, Hey, I can actually make this in America, make a decent living doing it and compete price heads up, you know, price. And they can't go backwards. Like these yeah. big companies will never go backwards. They'll never drop their price. They'll never go backwards. And so it's like the door is wide open for mm-hmm. American manufacturing and new companies. I think that's what's cool about this day and age. It's just about the awareness and the marketing, and that's where you guys have always shined. I mean, you were quick to, like, implement a marketing division on your team instead of, like, trying to struggle through doing it yourself. Yeah. Even not struggle, but, like, trying to just, like, maintain doing it yourself when you, you know, you hired people to do it, and that's, like, I think people don't realize that's the biggest part of it. You can't shortcut that, and... Selling direct to your consumers, if you're not doing it, you're you're literally, you're leaving your, you know, livelihood and your fate in other people's hands, and it's going to end badly. Like, yeah. it might be easy now, you might be making a lot of money, but, like, in the end of the day, if you're not direct consumer, the internet's so easy. You can do that. Like, you can literally just post once a day your product, and new people see it every day. Mm-hmm. And I think um, people, like... There's the old school mentality if you go to a speed shop and you sit down with the speed shop guy and that's how you figure out your parts or like 
but like people can figure it out now pretty well. The internet. Just going right to the manufacturer. Yep. And then when you talk about like American made stuff, people get like this misconception that like it's just American made, but there are other countries making great parts too. Italy. Yeah, you Australia know, has Australia. a really good amount of parts. Yep. I've, some stuff comes out of Canada. It's yep. it's not like... And he, honestly, as much as it pains me to say this, like some of the... Well, Japan makes incredible products. Yeah. They make some of the best on the planet. They're like the Germans, you know, and mm-hmm. Americans. Like, they make incredible stuff. But, like, there's always those levels too, right? Like, mm-hmm. even the third world countries making stuff, they can make nice stuff, but... The companies that are outsourcing there aren't paying, aren't wanting to pay for their nice stuff. They're paying for their like, you know, their yeah. bottom end stuff because it just fills a void. So yeah, I'm a huge uh, Toyota fan, and they have some of the best manufacturing I've ever seen. And any car that's Toyota is probably the car you should be driving daily mm-hmm. because they are always the better ones. Yep. But they have a concept on their assembly line where if any employee sees a better way to do something. They want you to stop the whole assembly line, and they will try to implement it. So, like, it's yeah. across the board. Like, any person that's doing a job, yep. if it could be done de- better or differently, stop it all, and let's evaluate. Yeah, they uh, they definitely don't let pride get in the way of, uh, you know, advancement. That's yeah, sure. I mean, that's probably why, like, these microphones and that camera are probably all made in Japan. <laughs> Yeah, I, the the, Sony. Uh, the company I used to work for, Olympus, the medical device company, like they, Japan was only one of the only places they could make that quality or level of product that was delivering, you know, the optics mm. and the, you know, use case and all that stuff. So it's well, most of your machines probably come from what Haas is in that. Haas is in California. That's California. Yeah. All right, I thought that. But was we have Australia. our first uh, Japanese machine now. Um, Interesting. That we that we purchased, but I mean. There's definitely places things can be made that mm-hmm. aren't here, but the, the process of actually, like, having pride in what you're doing is kind of the main thing. And then what about, like, raw materials, like, getting those from the right places? Because there's probably more variation in raw material than people would imagine. Yeah, I mean, like, you can have 6061 T6 aluminum and, like, one batch, it's perfect, and it creates, like, an awesome finish that you see. And the next one, it's like, why is this thing? Like, it's almost like smudging. It looks terrible. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm. it's so that we definitely go back and forth with that sometimes. But even like during the height of the pandemic, we never had issue getting American. We will only source American made like materials. That's interesting. Um, It's just, I don't know why, but it's actually easier than you think. Yeah. I mean, I know why, but it's easier than you think it is to get American made materials. I'd imagine with getting like aluminum and stuff like that, but then maybe once you get into like titanium and you got an exotic copper material, and stuff along those lines, that might be hard. more difficult. Titanium's yeah. not found in a whole lot of places. Yeah. I it's think, a really rare one. I think Russia might be one of the only yeah. places. I was reading something about some space shuttle stuff. They had to actually like fate. I think it was at the Smithsonian a couple of weeks ago, and they mm-hmm. were like, Back in the 60s, they were, like, buying titanium and lying about where it was, what it was going to be used for because we were all in the space yeah. race together. And they were, like, they created, like, shell companies to buy it from Russia and then, like, repurpose it. Yeah, it's like Skunk Works. Yeah. B, I think the B2 has a lot of, like, Russian titanium. Maybe that was it. Maybe yeah. it was, uh, maybe it was uh, yeah, that or the Blackbird or something yep. like that. Yeah. Secret titanium yeah. from Russia. They were, like, smuggling Russia, Russian titanium by way of... Shell companies. Yeah, that's so funny. I mean, yeah, we were definitely uh, doing some secret stuff like that, trying yeah. to be a uh, low key. Thankfully, we have a lot of our own resources. We're kind of lucky in the U.S., where yeah. a lot of comp- a lot of countries don't really have the ability to. Apparel is one of them. Like, it's almost impossible to get U.S. made apparel. Like, sometimes we had like three or four American like material and produced shirts, and then. Like, we bought another batch, and it just said, like, assembled in the USA. And I'm like, what the heck happened? Yeah. Even, like, it's just always a, a kind of a rat race in that respect. Yeah, that's a weird one. Like, any any clothing. We, we struggled with that when I was with Garrett. It was like, it'd be awesome to do American-made stuff. Yep. But then it's like, you really can't. Like, you've, you've it's very physically, difficult. like, it is, like, not, unless you start your own apparel manufacturing, yep. you're going to struggle because there's so many other companies yeah. already breathing down the door of the ones that do make it here. And a lot of them are made in, like, not China, though, like Mexico or, like, Guatemala. Mm-hmm. A lot of the apparel comes Pakistan, from there. Yeah. Yep. And all the uh, cotton, I think, comes from, like, Pakistan again. Yep. Like, 
Yeah, it's, it's a uh, world. that one I've struggled with. Like we've had a bunch of different U.S. made stuff, and it's like it's like a shell game. As soon as you come, you, as soon as you find it, it's gone again, and you're like, mm. okay. And then you don't. You also have to trust that they can supply the amount that you need, mm -hmm. and then also be able to like have quality. Yeah. Because like it's hard to beat the quality of like a Gildan shirt. Yep. They're super consistent. I've yep. never seen like a variation in the thousands of Gildan shirts I've had. Never seen a variation before, which is crazy. Yep. And then that whole level of things gets tough. Yeah, at the end of the day, kind of like electronics, that's also tough to... There's almost yeah. none made in the U.S. Um, but, like, there's certain countries that just excel in different things. And it goes back to the same thing. Like, you can get a good shirt from Pakistan. You can get a bad shirt from Pakistan. You can get good electronics from Taiwan, China, whatever. You can get yeah. bad. It, it just... I was going to say, it's weird that, like, for chip manufacturing, it's like... Taiwan is where everything comes from. And it's like, that just, it doesn't even like make sense when you think about it. You're like, yeah. why is it all focused in one spot? Yeah, I don't, I guess I should probably know, but I don't know because like most of that's like automated anyway. So it's not like it's the labor, I wouldn't think, you that's know, so, so weird. And I know like a lot of companies were supposed to be building their own factories here, but I don't, I've not seen that happen. Like I saw them break ground in like Arizona. You got money to do it. <laughs> yeah, I saw like break ground in Arizona and stuff, but I'm not sure I ever saw it like come to fruition. Yeah, they got taxpayer money to do it, but we actually have to see it happen. Yeah. They're probably trying to and they're just not as good and they're like 10 years behind on stuff and they're just like, oh, damn. Like, it's, let's just keep pushing it back. Kick, kick the can quick. I was going to say, when you're a big company and you got to like, meet investors you know needs and their desires to get dividends and stuff like it's just so easy to revert back like yeah oh covid's over so like yeah okay it's easy again you know type of deal is there one like when you look at a car and all the parts in it is that one thing you kind of try to avoid a little bit is like maybe electronics or wiring like what electronics are tough yeah, for the reason I talked about. What parts are you trying to avoid though where you're like eh, maybe we'll just stay here like I or is it just like I, I think mostly just game. ones that are outside of my knowledge base. Like I don't want to build something that like, especially now our engineering and our production is so wrapped up. It's like, well, I'm not gonna dive into transmissions. Yeah. Or I'm not gonna dive into torque converters or you know that I'm not gonna make gear sets for a rear end because it's like the amount of money you're gonna spend up front versus There's a lot of money in gear sets right now though. I'm sure there is, but I mean all the companies that make rear ends, yeah, rear gears basically shut down, like the three or four yeah. main ones. Yeah, there's like bidding wars for like a three seventy gear set yeah. pro gear. I was on the phone with Quick Performance and he was like, uh yeah man, it's not yeah <laughs> it's not looking good if you want that. I was like, really? He's like, Yeah, I sold one for like three grand the other day. I'm like, okay. Yeah, well like, that's a weird thing. One of the things we stay away from now is just castings like we could make we have a lot of parts we'd like to make that are cast but the lead times and like the ability for manufacturers to want to work with you is almost mm -hmm. you'll call them and they're like yeah we'll take a look at it and then they're like yeah we don't want to do it and i'm like wow you know yeah I've, I've thought about that with like other people that have cnc shops because like you guys have a lot of money in cnc machines and you obviously did medical equipment so like you have to look at those machines and it's like is this the most profitable thing it's making yeah, which no. is a weird thought yeah. because like you already have all these machines if you 180 and made something different yep i could make yeah we could make 20 different things but it kind of goes back to that like if you're not passionate about it would you want to do yeah. it yeah you know so it's an interesting thing because there's so many other like yeah i don't know once you have a machine like that it's like having like a, a truck and you drive you transport things for a living yep yeah, you gotta you... think what's the most profitable thing to move around exactly yeah i'm sure I mean, there's companies that make medical parts with the exact same pro like machines we have, but uh, and people come to us all the time like, "Hey, will you make suppressors? You know, yeah. like we'll we'll you know help you with the FFL or whatever whatever they call that." I'm like, "No, I just like I like that stuff, but I'm just not as passionate about it." Yeah, so. I had Arnie Tellman on here, and he was telling me about how he makes a lot of lowers because he's got a CNC machine shop, mm -hmm. and he does like intakes and then lowers yep. for ARs yep. and he's like yeah those are great you just keep making them and yeah you never like, have to develop part. anything new you just keep making it yeah you just keep making those things and he should have a out. robot he probably does he's, yeah. he's pretty cool on that oh, stuff yeah. where they he's got like, some cool stuff going on he's pretty good with that uh the robotics and like the next level of things yeah. I feel like there's some people that you realize and you're like oh dang they got some really cool cool stuff going on that you don't even realize yeah I mean honestly if you the 
cool thing about, you know, robotics and stuff like that is it does make you competitive with those countries that pay low labor rates because when you take the labor out of it, you know, you're still going to have labor and your design and your skilled people who are working on the machines and stuff. But when yeah. you take out a lot of that stuff, it's like, oh. Have you looked into children? Like <laughs> child labor a little bit. <laughs> I know McDonald's is using it lately. <laughs> oh my gosh. I heard they got caught with like, ch- like 12 year olds working the fryers uh, at one McDonald's. That does not like, surprise <laughs> me. No, I can't say we've looked into that. <laughs> Too short to reach. You just kind of throw them. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right. Maybe we should end it there. <laughs> oh, I'm not well, going there. Well, thanks for coming on, Doug. I'm sure this won't be the last. We'll have. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Once you uh, get your next venture maybe come back and we can talk about a little more your next giveaway but yeah motion raceworks guys go check them out follow them like them subscribe all that cool stuff they'll be uh this will probably be going up at the same time as six summer is happening so okay there'll be some cool stuff is that an open deal for yeah actually we're having a uh, party at our shop so i think it's june 8th um from four to uh Four to eight or nine o'clock. So We're gonna have food. Do it, Iowa, stuff. right? Do it, Iowa. Yes. Yeah. So if you find Iowa. yourself there, you're a resident of the Quad Cities, then <laughs> you're passing through. <laughs> you get to see all your people. If you can't make it out to the track, this yeah, it's it'll be a cool event. And everybody has now completed a huge journey, so it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, you'll see the bags under their eyes. You'll see the people that haven't made it there yet. <laughs> they might like be letting their guard down and feeling good about life a little bit. So. Yeah, or so. not. Maybe not. Good deal, man. Well, thanks for coming on. But that'll do it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time.